Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing With Fishes podcast, episode 119. This week we have uh, Darren from Blue Labs joining us. Thanks for joining us, Darren. You're quite welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for having episode me. 119. This week we have uh, Darren. <laughs> oh, let's get the loop with the chat. It's been a while since I've done that. <laughs> we used to do at that every week. At least Marty would, Marty would botch it or I would botch it or... You know, one of us would botch the intro, or we'd have to start it too early or too late. <laughs> um, uh, we also have uh, Roger from um, I Love Growing Marijuana. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's going to be a great show tonight. We got Marty. Hello. We got the awesome Josh, who just put on the super kick-ass Science of Regenerative Organic Cannabis Cultivation Conference. Yo, so much fun. Good times keep oh, rolling. Three more times. Right Tro trolled the guys over at Lyft with better knowledge and had a lot of those guys and vendors over there. That was really awesome. Yeah, so, for sure. Suits yeah. and flat caps. Oh, yeah. It was really good time. Look forward to the next one. When's the next one? February 22nd, 23rd, 24th in Redway, California. Oh, yeah. Be sure not to miss it. It's going to be awesome. I hear uh, we might have somebody else doing the concentrate talk now. Yeah, we got uh, the one and only Frenchy Canoli, the master of the resin. So I'm yeah, he will. Can you get any better than that? Yeah, he'll be awesome. So it'll be really good. So definitely come out if you guys are able to, and uh, we'll see you guys in uh, Redway. I'm not surprised he's willing to go to Redway. But... Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, whatever. All righty. Well, um, Darren's here joining us from Blue Labs. Um, a lot of us have used Blue Lab testing equipment. Um, they do all different kinds of sensors and, and, and you know, different things to help you actually know what's going on in your system. Um, we I met him at, um, was it MJ BizCon or was it Emerald? I forget which. MJ. MJ. Yeah. So we met at MJ. Uh, him and I got really talking uh, and I invited him onto the show. Uh, I know a lot of you guys use his equipment, so we thought it'd be really good to have him on. So thanks for joining us. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Blue Lab is all about? Well, Blue Lab has been around 22 years now. We manufacture and produce equipment to monitor and measure pH, EC, temperature, moisture uh, in soil and liquid. Uh, you can have an inline product. So if you're using a dosatron type of uh, delivery system to your, to your plants, we have something that can go in line for that. Matter of fact, dosatron quite often buys our products for their plug and play setups that they produce. Uh, they do it because we're reliable and uh, we're the most reliable, easiest to use product on the market. Uh, people love us. We have a very large following be because of reliability, not for any other reason. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that simplicity is what we really talk about. We, we, we promote the fact that we're easy to use Accuracy. So if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. But we, again, we, uh, we're number one in the industry for what we do. Uh, we do from simple handheld pens. It's a basic uh, introductory, if you will, device. Then you can go all the way up through a combination through our newest device, which is called the pulse meter. We also have a nutrient delivery system called the Pro Controller. I don't know how many people have seen it. We had it at MJ BizCon on display, and it was a hit because people are just tired of having to go and add the nutrients to the reservoir when they don't have the time, yet they have the feed schedule. They want it to feed every three, four hours, but they don't have time, and they're not there, so they end up with a, a uh, side uh, way of feeding it, which means they, they're jumping in for at lunchtime. Maybe they're coming back later in the day at dinner or whatever. But uh, this you can program to automatically as it comes back, you top off your res. This will add the nutrients and it's expandable. And we can get into more of that expandable up to 12 total pumps and it'll handle our small pumps will handle up to a thousand gallon reservoir. Uh, the big pumps up to about an eight thousand gallon res. So we can, we can accommodate almost any type of grow operation out there. <clears throat> so what kind of parameters do your uh, various testing equipment uh, do? I would assume pH, but what other ones do they do aside from pH? We're going to do, we do EC, 
Our number one selling device is called the Truncheon. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Truncheon, but it's our number one seller. It's a stick that looks like a billy club. Actually, it's actually named after a billy club. That's what they call them in, in England, the Truncheon. Um, you just stip, stick it into your, your nutrient solution. It's going to light up. There's no on switch. It'll come up. The lights will tell you exactly where you are with your nutrients, either in PPM or EC. It'll do both or CF for those in Europe and or connect Canada and it'll stay on as long as you have it in the solution turn off as soon as you take it out so you get an automatic reading uh, ec is so much easier to understand than parts per million uh, because you're hitting a specific number even though on this side of the of the world the horticultural world we all look at parts per million um, but if they can learn to understand ec it's so much easier because you're going to hit a number 1.1 1.3 whatever that number is you don't have to worry about what your nutrient line is manufactured on 700 or 500 parts per million this will eliminate that need for that <clears throat> so ec is very important as is parts per million they work hand in hand with ph uh, i'm sure a lot of your listeners know that uh they can get into lockout how many people have if I saw a raise of hands, it'd probably be a lot. I've gotten into lockout because they just weren't monitoring one or the other or both. So this way we make it so it's very simplistic for you to actually con you know, control that by constantly monitoring. Very cool. So what are some of, um, what would be like an entry level? Someone just wants to know what their pH, or I know you guys have a really awesome one that does pH, EC, and TDS. Um, what, what's kind of some of the entry level stuff if someone just wants to have a continuous monitor or even just a, a, a test stick or whatever? What would be kind of your entry level stuff that you guys have for, for maybe a newer grower or someone who's kind of getting started? The, the, the basic or simplest form for us is what we call pens, a pen version. It's a small version. I have them and I can grab them and show them to you. But a pen version is very small. It's handheld. It's probably about seven, eight inches long. And you can just drop it into your tank or hold it down into the tank. It's going to give you an instant read on your pH. Uh, or you can use the, the EC version or PPM version of a pen. And so you can have two. We put them together in what we call the grower's toolbox. They come together. It's cheaper if you buy them as a, as a boxed unit versus buying them individually. But it gives you that option to either buy them separately or buy them together and read both. Because again, I'll go back to a work hand in hand. We really want you to monitor both, but it's an individual thing. It's a personal thing, if you will. Sure. Yeah, I know in aquaponics, we have problems using EC as a readable number because of all the biologics and it. it's a lot harder to suss that out um, specifically. So we do a lot of things on individual nutrient PPM or total PPM or, um, um, you know, just keeping things in the pH range. Sure, uh, absolutely. Depending on what we're doing. So, uh, so you have a, a lot of cool um, dose dosing equipment as well. You want to talk a little bit more about that? You were talking about how that was expandable. A lot of us use um, you know other feeds for our top feeding and things like that. That, that you know is a really interesting uh, thing to bring up. Yeah, the, <clears throat> we call it the Pro Controller. Pro, Pro Controller is a box that allows you to adjust your feed schedule to your needs. So you can time it or set it to time for your on feeding and your off times when it's coming back and you're going to be doing your top off, but it's expandable. Initially, you're, you can buy the pro controller and either three or four pump setup, and then you can add to that by adding another three or four pump setup or so it's totally expandable up to 12 pumps. So you can add either 12 nutrients or 11 nutrients and one pH buffer or adjustment so that you can regulate exactly where you are. A lot of people um, want to be able to do add both up and down. And we are pretty much against that because the two solutions just fight each other and you get into more of a seesaw effect. And all you're doing is upping your PPMs in your solution, along with going through a whole lot of solution, you're up and down because they constantly battle each other, which is just nuts. But you get the people that want to do that. If they had a little more understanding of why they should just typically your grow is either going depending on if you're in veg or blue it's going one way or the other you're either going up or you're going down based on your nutrient line and your period of growth so if you can just 
stay at one and use just up or down, you're going to be much happier in the long run. And your plants are going to be much happier. The, the more you can maintain them at a steady pH, whatever you decide is the best pH for your plants, you're going to be much happier and they're going to be much happier in the long run. They're going to grow better. You're going to have less problems in the long run. But the Pro Controller has been out now for about a year and a half. Uh, it's done very well and, and continues to grow because we didn't do a lot of hard push marketing on it. We are very, Blue Lab is a very sort of soft sell company. We're not aggressive. We let people uh, find out about us pretty much by word of mouth. We don't do a lot of advertising. We used to do some, but now that it's catching on and people are understanding the benefits of a pro controller and working in a reservoir system versus a, uh, a pressurized system like a dosatron, they are understanding more people on our side of the of the world uh, in horticulture are doing more of a reservoir type growing system. And they can be reg big reservoirs. You can have a 500, 5,000 gallon reservoir feeding a lot of plants. It, it'll handle both. That's really, really, really awesome. It, it's, you know, it's nice to have these continuous readers that and continuous dosing music <laughs> that can you know, provide that kind of, you know, pre-mixing and all that. Do you guys have anything that's like a uh, web enabled so that, you know, if someone wanted to, to start that, you know, remotely or anything like that? We don't have it that when you get into remote operations, so being able to, to control it from your phone, that's two way communication. Right now we have one way communication via what we call our connect series. So you can actually see everything that's going on with any of our connect series products, which include the pro controller, the pH controller, and our guardian connect so you can see what's going on one of the things we do is we very much listen to our customers one of the things we hear is one i can never get away and two i don't trust the people that i've asked to look on my grow when i do get away because they want to get in there they want to tweak it or they don't show it all so this way you can pull up on your phone what's going on with your grow and say hey John, Bob, Tommy, whatever, you haven't been over there. What's going on with my pH? It's climbing or my temperature's getting out of whack. So this way you can you can actually get, a, get some control of that. But we are very much moving forward and we're going to have that ability to do the two-way com communication. When that's going to come, that's up to our programmers, but it's coming. We're definitely working toward it. It's, it's something that's on the horizon, if you will. And uh, they haven't given us a date, but they don't, definitely told us it's coming. You're, you're going to be able to do it from your phone. Now, do you have any um, pH controllers? Do you have any uh, pH meters that will turn an outlet off or on, or any, or, or um, you know, maybe ones that will dose things for you uh, for, for you know adjusting pH automatically? Absolutely, and we that's exactly what we call the pH controller. It you have the ability to set up your range of what you want your pH. We typically say. You know, give it a little room for movement. A little bit of movement <coughs> is a very good thing. You're going to pick up more nutrients in wider bands, but we also don't want it to go, you don't want to go from 5.8 to 6.8. So maybe you go from 5.8 to 6.1, and then the controller will sense that it's gotten to your upper limit and kick on and automatically start to bring it back down. So instead of this, <clears throat> typically what's happening is overnight your pH is climbing, or if it's going down, depending on which way you're running, but it, you get to a high point or a low point, and now you have to shock it to bring it back down to where you were or where you want it. And then while you're at work, it's doing the same thing. You got to so you end up with these high mountains and low valleys of up and down, which is not consistent for good plant growth. So what this does, it allows a little bit of movement. You pick up more bandwidth in the nutrients, so you get a very very even waveform that just allows it to move a little bit and brings it back down to alignment. A little bit of movement brings it back down. And it, you can have it monitored as often as every 15, 20 minutes or every hour, depending on the size of the reservoir and how long it's gonna to take to, add, once you add that additive, and how long it's gonna to take to mix and check it again. But you can check it every 15, 20 minutes and add it as needed. Most times it just sits there. Now, um, do you, uh, assuming that it, you know, your inputs were were appropriate. Um, is that something that you can get organically to use on an organically certified system? Yes. Um, do you have any clients that are using those on that? Absolutely. Yeah. We have people that use just uh, lime juice 
for their pH buffer uh, or vinegar if that's what they're doing. But as far as oh, cool. that's like uh, I have some really early aquarium books from like the 30s through the 70s that are you know real old and they're they're all on the baking soda and vinegar and lime juice. And that's interesting. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone use that in quite a while. That's really cool. Well, lime juice is the one of the strongest natural acids in in that's available to you. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they use the clean grills, they you know, in kitchens because it's very acidic and works very quickly. So it's very well known that it'll work as a buffer as well. Well, it'll add some PPMs, but it's not a lot. Is there is there citrine in lemon juice, like there is in citric acid based, or is that do you know? I do. Not, I can't answer that. Uh, my guess is yes, there would be. There would be no reason that it wouldn't be there. All right. Um, uh, so, uh, what other, um, you know, uh, what other, uh, uh, you, uh, what other uh, things can uh, aside from, I guess, the the couple of things we've gone over. You got, uh, you have total PPM meters. Do you, um, we want to tell us about the ones that you guys have for that? Yeah, we have. Uh, well, just for PPM, or you want to know about more of our product line? Um, yeah, either one. All right. I'll, what I'll do is I'll start with some of our newer products. Uh, a lot of people are very familiar with our older products, which we have the Combo Meter, which is our number two bestseller, which is a PPM slash EC pH monitor and temperature monitor all in one. It's a handheld device, very similar to this. This is not a um, Combo Meter. This is our newest meter called the multimedia pH meter, um, but I will talk about that shortly. That's, you know, we, we started out with just handhelds and now we've grown as a company into doing more automated type products and remote uh, monitoring products, but this still remains our staple. Uh, the truncheon number one, combo number two, pens then come into number three. Um, this <coughs> is gonna be a very hot item the multimedia pH meter. This works with our newest probe. And I don't know if you've seen the new leap probe. I think you did Stephen, when you were out there, but um, this is the, I'll hold it up here so you can see it. This is the multimedia or leap probe. It's got a pointed glass tip and it's very hardened glass. So it's much more durable than the other products that are out there. Most people are familiar with the glass balls types. Uh, which are very fragile. It's like not very fragile, but it's really dependent on use. And a lot of people, we've watched people throw them into the reservoirs. Uh, they bang around in the reservoir because they're right by the, the flow, which we very much advocate. Don't do that. Don't put them in the flow. That will not only change your pH reading. If you just right. take a pH probe and shake it in there, it's going to adjust your pH reading. So when this thing's in there and it's spinning around, it's going to be continually in flux. So what we want you to do is move it to the far end of a reservoir away from that flow and away from the, the um, pump that you've got in there. But this one is very hardened glass. I don't know if you could hear that, but I smacked it on this desk I have. Uh, I do that every time I go out and I talk about it because it's great. The only thing that we suggest, and I don't know if you can see it right here, is this brown medium right here is a, it's where everything gets absorbed. So we tell people, just take this probe, mix up a slurry of whatever medium you're growing in, whether it's happy frog, cocoa, whatever, mix a slurry and set this down in that, per, in that slurry for about 15 minutes, then calibrate it. And then you're going to be accurate. You only have to do that the first time. After that, you don't have to worry about it. What we want to do is orient that medium to whatever you're growing in. This, um, this starts out really nice and white, but as you can see from mine, it's not at all white. It's very brown, just from being used, like I use it just in for showing for people. But the, the rapid switch to it has been amazing for us because people are just jumping to it because of durability. They're just frustrated with having to replace their probes on a relatively routine basis. Oh yeah, and it's expensive too because you know I've got a, I've got another company and I bought expensive meters and those probes are like eighty to hundred bucks every yep. year. So you got to replace them. 
So, and I know about how they can be a little touchy there too, the electrodes and all that. That is really neat. I love the idea about the slurry. That's one of the great things that people talk about in your product is that you don't have to calibrate your products for the most part as much as you do other products. Isn't that true? About every 30 days. All of our products have an indicator on them that show when it needs to be calibrated. A pen has a little oh. check mark that shows up when it's been calibrated. And you always want to calibrate <laughs> to two <laughs> points. You know, not one point calibration. Right. Bad. You need two points of reference. So when you've calibrated the two points on a pen, you get a check mark. On a meter like this, down in here in the screen, you get a little four and a little seven that show up. It shows you've done both, and that'll those will disappear at about 30 days to remind you, guess what? Time to recalibrate. So it's not a, a, a continual, yes, there's maintenance to it. Yes, you have to store it in what we recommend is our storage solution, which is KCL or potassium chloride. That's the reference that we use. A lot of people have the misunderstanding that they can store it in uh, because they hear hydrate the probes um, or pens stored in RO or distilled water thinking it's quote unquote clean water. No, you're right. It's a no, no. Um, because what happens is through osmosis, you get a depletion of the ions in the device, the probe or the pen, because you can't stop it. It's just nature. It tries to balance those two solutions. So what happens is it gives away its ions. So instead of getting say two years out of a pen or a probe, you may only get 13 months. Then you end up coming back on, well, I thought you thought, told me this would last. Well, it will last if you if you take care of it and you do the right things. So we try to, we're very big on education and teaching people the right way to do things with our equipment. And ultimately they get a better grow out of it, which is what we're after. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty neat that it tells you when you need to calibrate it. That's a real nice feature there. Oh yeah, it's absolutely yeah, that's, nice. That's worth a few extra bucks right there, I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah, there's too many devices out there now that that I'm and I won't go into names, but they they yeah, there there's no indicator. It's kind of a guesswork, and you don't even know if it's holding calibration. Um, we will actually hold calibration beyond when that check mark or that four and seven disappear. Uh, now that that becomes a little bit of a gray area. Um, typically, it's a couple days after it disappears. So there's not this immediate hurry. Run to the store buy my four and seven solutions so I can recalibrate. You can wait a day or so, but you do definitely want to get on it because you're going to start to get some drift over a period of time. So instead of it being four and seven, it may end up being five and eight or whatever, but that, that's usually a couple days after it's, it's gone away. It's not immediate. So, so how often, maybe I, I maybe I did cut out for a second, but how often would you recommend then recalibrating? You don't have to recalibrate till those indicators that I talked about, the check mark and the yeah. four and seven disappear. You know, no, is there a regular schedule? You know, if I'm a commercial grower, I'm gonna want to just recalibrate on a schedule. Would you say once a week, once a month, every other week? What would be a good, you know, if I'm a commercial person trying to just do something regular, is there a particular um, interval that you would say is probably a good rule of thumb? Yeah, I would say once a month. If you wanted to pick a date and say every first of the month we're gonna recalibrate and take an hour in the morning and do all of our meters, that would be the, your, probably your best. Just pick a scheduled plan maintenance and do it right then and be done with it. Uh, <clears throat> rather than having all these different meters on different schedules, yeah. you know, this one's today, next, this one's next week, two weeks later is another one, just do them all at one time. Then you'll put them all on the same schedule and just make it a routine maintenance item. And and I know those uh, you know for the continuous monitors those probes have a life on them correct it's about two years before you need to replace them uh, correct me if I'm wrong at least that's what it used to be when I used to do it with no you're correct it's it's on average we see about two years out of a probe and really about two to two and a half years out of pens and and you know there's so many variables here um, that can change that maintenance you know are they hydrating it properly are they keeping it clean. Um, all these little factors come into play. And I don't care if it's my equipment or somebody else's. It's going to affect the life of the probes and those devices, whether it's mine or somebody else's. That's a great point. So why don't you bring up like proper probe care and, and, and how you would, you know, if you're using them, how what's the best way to maintenance and clean them and make sure they're, they're going to last as long as you can? The, the biggest thing that we suggest is that with our, with our pens, 
<clears throat> on here you can see we have this little cover that goes on the very end that you keep your storage solution, whether it's ours or you're the manufacturer of the probe or pen that you're using, that you keep this fluid in here. This keeps it hydrated. Typically, we all manufacture the correct solution for our probes and pens. So in our case, our probes are filled with potassium chloride. There's two pretty much acceptable solutions for measuring pH and it's potassium chloride and calcium chloride. We just happen to use potassium chloride because it's more accurate, but there are companies that use calcium. That's fine. They're both acceptable. But what you want to maintain in here in this little reservoir is potassium chloride and ours. Or if you're using somebody that a different manufacturer, then you're going to use their storage solution. You do not want to use any kind of tap water. Our own distilled are definitely no nos. And then you, you know, you can you could actually use nutrient solution. If you leave this pen, this probe or your pen in your nutrient solution, there's not going to be any exchange of ions because typically the ions in those solutions tend to be higher than what we have in here. So you don't have any loss. That's why you can actually leave this, just hang down in the reservoir and do its job mm -hmm. continuously 24 seven. But at some point you're going to have to take it out <clears throat> the probe and you're going to have to clean it. So what you want to do is get, we manufacture a kit that it comes with a toothbrush, and that's what we want you to use, a very soft toothbrush. And we make a little bit of, um, we call it pH probe care kit and a cleaning solution that you put on the toothbrush and then you just scrub, scrub, scrub the, the, the glass tip as best you can and then rinse it under running water. The, you know, a lot of people are concerned, is it gonna be okay? And well, wait a minute, it's in your reservoir. It's waterproof, it's gonna be okay. So just rinse it under running water and you should be good. If you happen to take it out, which a lot of people do, and they don't store it, it used to be, hey, if it dries, it dies. Well, we have found out. You've heard that, haven't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I think I probably had it happen back in the day, too, because there are some yeah. friends that if it dries, it dies. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we have found out you can rehydrate them in our storage solution depending. And when I say depending, if I left this in the trunk of my car in June for the last three weeks, more than likely it's probably dead. But if I've just left it out for a few days and, you know, cause I was busy, it ran out and I happened to have it on my, my uh, workbench or whatever, you can rehydrate it just by adding some storage solution to a shot glass or a cup, setting it in there overnight. And a lot of times it'll come right back to where it was. So it's not as critical as we used to think that it was. We've found out that rehydration is very effective. You're always going to try it anyway. I can tell you that's something too. You're, you know, once you, when you put that kind of money into your testing equipment, you're, you're going to try to bring it back to life before you give up and buy a new probe or a new pen or whatever. Oh, absolutely. But yeah. So yeah, I've been down that road many, many times over the years, you know, yeah, it's always, getting crazy if something happens and you end up walking off and leaving your pen sitting there, you know, <laughs> you go, ah. come back and you go, Oh no. Yeah. It's uh it's a, it's, a, it's very common in our industry that people let them dry out. Um, so we have done experimentation with drying them out intentionally as well as rehydration. And we found out they can, at least ours can be rehydrated. Um, I can't speak for everybody's product on the market, but I know that we can rehydrate ours with within a reasonable period of time. So, and that's even up to like two weeks, we've dried them out and they've come back. So, you know, again, I wouldn't test that theory of the trunk in the middle of June in the hot summer, but I think <laughs> it, it could work in, uh, you know, if you just left it on your bench in your basement or somewhere you know, in a professional grow somewhere, <laughs> it'd be all right. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, is there, um, uh, what other kind of like, um, you know, newer growers stuff aside from maybe the pH pen or whatever might be something that people want to think about, you know, looking at or, or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe step two or phase two kind of things they might want to look at. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that we produce is called the grow book. I don't know how many people are familiar with the grow book. It's uh, readily available at most grow stores. Uh, we do it as a free publication for people to pick up, but it talks about the importance of measuring pH 
along, <clears throat> excuse me, along with PPM so that you don't get into lockout, so that you get the ideal optimum nutrient uptake by keeping your pH. Too many times I talk to people at, at events that say, oh, I don't need your product. You know, I've got good growth. And Stephen and I were talking about this earlier. I'll say, well, what week are you in? They'll tell me, oh, I'm in week, you know, 11 or 12. And they'll hold up their hand and they're three feet off the ground saying, oh, I've got good growth. And I'm like, what the hell is that all about? You know, you should be five foot, six foot tall, have great, you know, plants, but they're happy. They're, if that's what they want to do. I'm happy with that too. I'm not going to try to talk you into buying something you don't think you need. If you're still using drops and tape, well, I ask people, you know, when do you use that? Are you in your grow room? Yep. Typically is the answer I get. Are your lights on? Yep. Oh, well, doesn't the lights distort your eyes? So how do you know what coloration that drop or that tape is telling you? So something that's in a digital format um, makes the most sense because it's instant. It's not lying. You don't have to rely on a color. You can see what it's telling you, whether it's 5'8", 6'2", wherever you need to be, you can be there. So for a basic or new newbie, um, they probably want to start off with pens. It's just a yeah. suggestion. We know that there's going to be a natural progression. Once you start off and you get it and you become a better grower, you're going to move to another product like a combo meter because it's just more simplistic. It's got more advantageous uh, the, you know, features on it, and it's all encompassed into one product. You don't have to start jumping around and getting other products. Um, and then you're going to move to a continuous monitoring device like a Guardian. A guardian is something that sits in your reservoir and will 24-7 monitor your pH, your EC, and your temperature of that reservoir. And you can get a guardian or a guardian connect. The, the connect feature allows you to look at it remotely, as we talked about earlier. So that becomes something for more of an aggressive or more advanced grower, but anybody can use it. They're not hard to use. They're very easy, but I don't, I don't tend to tell people that are just starting out this is what you need. You need a guardian. No, you don't need a guardian. You need a pen that's a reliable and effective. And then if you want to move to your parts per million or a truncheon pen, or then you can go to those devices as well. <clears throat> I think that guardian situation is you probably find that more towards commercial growers starting out. And especially with where you have a 300 or 500,000 gallon well, rent, like you were talking, you wouldn't necessarily use that in a bubble bucket you know that'd be something for a big reservoir those guardians but those guardians aren't super expensive they're they're what uh I, I, i'll let you say so don't get it wrong yeah no, base guardian you're going to be around 360 and then if you yeah. get into the connect feature it's going to add about a hundred dollars to it that's not bad um, yeah, yeah but if you, if you look at all the ph testing over the course of a year or two you know you could have spent that and got continuous monitoring and more accurate and the other thing I want to bring up, because you brought up a great point, and I don't know if everyone heard it when they were you were talking about it, is if I'm if I'm colorblind or if I have color blindness in part of the palette, which is to be honest with you, almost 20% of the population is at least somewhere on the color palette has has an issue. Um, uh, you know, having a continuous pH monitor with a digital readout like yours, or uh, if you're doing individual nutrient PPMs like Hannah Hannah meters, um, if you need nitrates or ammonia or that kind of stuff. Um, those are great solutions for people that other, you know, before you guys came along, um, there was no way to, to tell a color for pH except for titration, which good luck if you're colorblind, you might, you know, you might as well just give up and find a different hobby, you know? So I've even sold a bunch of the guardians for planted aquariums for that exact reason. Yeah. We're very big into the aquarium side. Believe it yeah. Or not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes I sense. Aquarium yeah, guys, yeah. Love yeah. Labs, continuous monitors. Our That's PH why I first got exposed to the, our pH controller is becoming big into aquarium and aquaponic setups. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they're just effective. They work. They're easy. They're quiet. Uh, there's no maintenance in essence to it. Uh, and it does. It's, it's effective. See, I, I use one on my, my, on my greenhouse reservoir and see, I have an automatic top off valve. Okay. So, It'll, so it'll, and I've got well water. I've got a real good well, and it's about 7.2 pH. So as I add water to it, it, the pH rises. So I got a doser that turns on a little. I actually kind of made mine from an old school guy, gave me a medical pump, you know, so I got my diluted acid, and it just goes through that little medical pump, through little, you know, and, and adds in a little bit at a time. 
until it gets to the pH, you know. And generally, when that's happening, I've got an X, I've got a, I've got a flow going on, so that the, so the, the solution's mixing as it's being done, you know. Instead of just trying to get it and leave it, you know, to get to a certain pH and cut off, because if it's not mixed up, then that's not going to be accurate either. Yeah, right? absolutely not. Yeah, <clears throat> that's that's the only issue, and it's not even a big issue. It's very small that we have with our pH controller is that everybody in our industry <laughs> has no freaking patience. They're all in a hurry. So when they go to adjust the pH, even with our pH controller, they try to set it on very short time cycles. Instead of allowing that pH adjustment to be added, get circulated into that, to that reservoir and then check it again, they want to add it and check it, add it and check it. Well, if they just give it a little bit of time, it has to get fully Right. immersed and and diluted into everything else that's there then you check it so we tell people wait a minimum even in a small 20 gallon operation you want to give it 15 minutes no harm no foul because you've just added your adjustment it's going to start moving you just don't know how much yet so give it time to get circulated so that now you can be accurate and and at the next time it needs to check it if it needs to add more it will if it doesn't it won't it just sits there but if they, we can teach them patience, then we got it. Yeah, and it's like that. You said if they add it and check it, add it, check it, add it, check it. Eventually, you go from being a little, just a little bit below, to way too high or way too low. You know, yeah. like all of a sudden it it all just exponentially the acid kicks in and gets all, and it's like that's why. And you get these people talking. Yeah, I had to add pH down, then I had to add pH up, and like you said, that's not a good idea. You need to take your time. Let it settle in and get, like you said, 15 minutes is a standard, I think, that we, we teach and that all the manufacturers say pretty much to put your, adjust your pH, let it sit 15 minutes and check it again and see if you're good. You know, well, I was going to say it's a lot of it's pretty extreme laziness, you know, like the first couple of <laughs> times you, you do a reservoir, you, you should just dial in how much you need to, to use. You know, so I have three of those pH controllers and I use them for my, um, my water cloners, I string them together and like, you know, I'll string four water cloners together with one common res and then I'll have that pH adjuster in there. Nice. But I know that I need to add so much pH down to get in within the relative range. And then I can just let the pH controller kind of dial it in the last little bit, you know? Well, when you're making a new solution, that's what you do. But when we're talking about adding water to top off your res and you having a doser, that's dosing your nutrients and adjust. Then you have your doser to adjust your pH. It's slightly different than if you just are making your, your nutrients in a reservoir by hand every two or three days. And that would be where, yeah, I got the same thing. When I make a fresh reservoir of nutrients, I, I have actually like, you know, a cup and a half or whatever it is of the acid that I'm using. And that's, and, and then, yeah, it'll come out right on the money once you get it dialed in, you know. I mean, if you put, you got the same well water. Now, city water might be different, but when you got a well that's consistent, you know, pretty consistent over 15 years, and you add, you, you, you know exactly how much uh, acid to add to your, you know, 300-gallon tank, you know. To right, but it's, it's still pretty nice, like, because when I'm cloning, you know, for t seven to ten days, that I'll get drift. So with that, that controller, I don't have to worry about it, you know. Right, right, yeah. No, but I'm glad, I'm glad you made that mention about getting your reservoir initially close to where you want it. You know, too many people buy this type of device and then <clears throat> they'll mix up their newts and they'll never check it. They just turn this thing loose and say, go get it, magic machine, bring it up where I want it. And that's not what it's for. It's a maintenance yeah. type device that will keep right. it at the right level versus trying to bring it from you know, eight down to, to 6.2 or wherever you want it to be or up to where you want it to be. Instead, get it close and then let this bring it, tweak it, just finalize what you want and then it'll maintain that. Too many people though don't want to do that. It's, I don't know if it's too much work or how they want to look at it. You got to know your chemicals. You got to know your, what you're adding to your, you know, what you're adding to your reservoir. You got to know what, you know, you got to have that, you know where you're getting it close i i can't imagine people I, yeah i i can hear what you're saying you guys are saying too i can't imagine somebody actually doing that but i guess they do don't they oh absolutely <laughs> the other thing when you said about adding chemicals and, and mixing up you gotta know i see people at um, events they'll go around they'll collect every freebie they can get their hands on 
and then they get home and they're playing mad scientist and just mixing this stuff together. And a lot of these nutrients don't play nice together. And so you end up with what's called precipitation. And I'm sure most growers have experienced it where all of a sudden they're getting these globs and clumps that just fall to the bottom. And it's because these two chemicals don't react well with each other, but they don't know that. Instead, they just start dumping in thinking, oh, I'm going to have a great grow because I've mixed this all. This is all the good stuff. Yeah, well, it doesn't work that way either. Something not only that, not only that, but you end up with the triple and do, uh, double and triple dose in certain minerals. Yeah, because absolutely. If you absolutely. got three different things you're adding, they all might have the necessary nitrogen you need. And once you mix them all together, you got three times the nitrogen you need. So uh, yep. you, uh, that's a good point of how you run into trouble mixing. Yeah, don't mix and match. You, if, you know, we, we, we do our own, you know, we mix everything from a bag. You know, we buy all everything and then mix it from a bag. Um, you know, because my greenhouse is hydroponic. Okay. And we're converting it to aquaponics because these guys have me convinced that it's going to be awesome. You know, and I just I've learned so much in the last year and a half or so, you know, on this show and, and doing a lot of research and, 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 and taking into account other other ways to do things more naturally. But, yeah, I mean, you know, we mix everything from, you know, you know everything's measured, you know, or weighed. You know, like, like, uh, like, again, like Josh was saying, you know, we know how much acid it takes when we fill up the tank right off the bat. Mm -hmm. You know, you measure out, you get your, you, you know, whatever you're using, whatever type of acid you're using. And then, you know, you've measured out and dump it in and you're real close. And that's what, and that's when those dosers come in, you know, to do an excellent job for you, you know. Oh, yeah. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot of yes. experimentation in the beginning, but hopefully you get better as you go. I've been in horticulture 31 years now, uh, and I've worked with, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Proven Winners, but I was their licensing manager for a few years, uh, quite a few years, and then I moved on. Eventually, I'm now in cannabis, and I, you know, I love horticulture, and I love this side of the business. It's a lot of fun. You meet some great people <laughs> here, uh, and they've got some great stories. Some I'm good, some not so good, but they're still fun and entertaining, no matter how you look at it. For sure. I'm going to also show you one of our newest products. I don't know how well you can see it. Uh oh. Yeah. It looks like a taser. I know. Everybody kind of. Is that a soil probe? Oh, the pulse meter. Um, the pulse is designed to check moisture, temperature, and EC in any kind of growing medium. Uh, except right now, not grow dan, not, not rock wool. Uh, we will, <laughs> it's coming. Uh, but what we found out is that rock wool, as the roots become more prolific in the in the block, they actually changes the EC, which is something we weren't prepared for. Everything else is remains fairly static, but rock wool changes. So we've had to go back and re-engineer and do a different. This works on an algorithm, and it actually works with an app so that you can now see it from your phone. And when you take a reading, and I'll show you that app here momentarily. <clears throat> Let me connect to it. But this is, our, this is our app that goes on and it's gonna connect here. Let me pair it with the device. You can see I'm pairing it. You press and hold and then it'll say let go and then now it's paired with it. So when you go out and you take readings, what you can do is you take this and you put it down in to your container and it's going to give you an instant read to your phone and <clears throat> allow you to know exactly what your EC is, your moisture content and your temperature is of those containers. So you have a home screen. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, it looks something like this and you can adjust the the um, the EC high and low here, these are little roller switches. I don't know if you can see that. And then you can just adjust it wherever you need it to be by rolling it and, okay. you, press, and you press OK and it sends it to our device. This works via Bluetooth. So it reads instantly on your device. I'm going to take a reading here. We'll go to our measurements. Well, it's not going to show up well because I've got red now. And when I take a reading, it's going to show up red as well. But if I take a reading on the device, it's going to give me either red lights or green lights. And there you can see I'm getting red lights. And then it'll update on my phone, which makes it really nice. People want to be able to have instant gratification. 
and this works from that perspective. It'll give them an instant read. The bigger benefit is we have a little screen here that you can touch and it gives me a history of everything I've taken. Oh geez, since you know, since I think MJ Biscon <laughs> I've got on here. But you can download this to an Excel file and get a year over year. So last year, hey, what did we do right? We had a really good crop. What was our moisture content? What was our EC readings? Um, what was their temperature of the containers? All that affects how a plant grows and becomes a stronger plant. So if you can maintain that, say, hey, we had a real, or what did we do wrong? It was really bad. We didn't have a good crop. Now you can go back and look. Hey, geez, our moisture was too high. It takes temperature too? It takes temperature too. Of well the container. Moisture. Wow. And what's the price point on that device? Because I'm asked all the time about people are trying to get, because they buy those cheap $14 soil meters and they you know they start having problems that'd be the perfect thing for those people yeah they don't work this is 299 dollars suggested yeah. retail i haven't seen one out there for 299 yet they're always less uh, well that's probably why it works too because yeah it's probably a reason it costs 299 so but still if you're serious that'd be great to have yeah we're we're a uh, very um for lack of a better word anal company we don't release something until it works so yeah. we, uh, we, we keep going and going and going and we'll test it. And this thing's been testing now for about two years before we find, we just released it six weeks ago. It's brand new. I'm just out now promoting it and people are loving it because you can also on here, if you wanted to on your phone, make notes um, and say, hey, you know, table two, greenhouse three or whatever, we have a problem and you can list what that problem is and it'll stamp it right to your reading that you just took. Um, the other big thing is right now it's just for uh, Android phones. And we did that intentionally because <clears throat> you don't have to have this, the phone with you for this device to work. You set up all your parameters, like I showed you, your highs and your lows on the device. You send it to the pulse and you can send somebody out with this and they can start taking readings. And as long as they're getting green lights, they can keep going when they get red. They can now make, make it throw a flag in that pot or container and keep moving. This device will hold up to 2,000 readings. And when it gets back to the phone, it'll download all that to the phone. So you have record of it. But the so, reason we didn't go ahead. So you have to have a phone then. So yeah, but you can buy a cheap Android phone for 30 bucks to use just as okay, a dedicated okay, device. Sure you can buy refurbished ones for 30 to 50 bucks. Okay. I just bought a I'm brand new one. I'm a legally blind shut-in, so I've never really gone anywhere. I'm always here. I just know, bought a brand new one at Target uh, for thirty bucks. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, it's brand new, not refurbished. Um, and the reason we did that is because nobody wants to give their their Apple phone, which is a thousand bucks, to somebody and tell them to go out and start taking <laughs> measurements, because now they're gonna, you know, either they could break it or they're gonna start getting into your porn and all that stuff that's on there. So, you know, they don't want to hand over their phone to somebody. This way, they can give them this cheap phone and say, go to it. I mean, for $1,000, you can buy a hell of a lot of $30 phones. <clears throat> so you can just dedicate it to the device. Well, see, that saves everybody because, you know, people with iPhones, they, they everybody hates the other company. They either love what they got. And I think we got something going on in chat where people are talking about that right now. Like, they like their iPhone, you know. And... uh and but see, if you can pick up an Android for thirty bucks to add to that to pair with it, that's really not bad at all. You no. know, because even I could see your phone. I have a hard time seeing texting and stuff like that on the phone. But I could I could see yours over the. Of course, it was this big because I got a forty-eight inch TV on my, <laughs> my computer monitor. You know, I use HDMI for my computer so I can see it. But but still, I was able to see it. So I got a feeling that the way you've got it set up, I got to applaud that because. For me to be able to make any heads or tails out of what you were doing on that phone, and, and the way you got it set up, it looks like it's not all jumbled together or crammed together. You got everything's in a little bit of space, and you can actually recognize it. Yep, and that was the idea. We wanted it, you know, to keep with our our basic message in the in the industry, which is success by simplicity. Keep it simple and allow it to be user friendly. And to, in today's world, everybody wants an app. And they want it to be instantaneous. So this way they can use it at their convenience 
and, and they don't have to, you know, very soon. And the next, uh, we're, we're being told about five to six weeks, we're going to have it for iOS as well. And for the Apple users, they, it will be available. Uh, it just We just went after the Android aspect early because of the, the aspect we, you know, people don't want to give up their phone to hand to somebody else. Is there any talk of um, making that thing uh, so it can connect to a solenoid valve to control watering? Not as of yet. Um, <laughs> we, we have a lot in the works right now and I can't really go into a lot of those, but there's a lot of things that we're working on for, uh, just an example, total environment control systems that you can will be able to control much more than just monitor. You'll be able to control CO, pH, uh, you know, light, uh, all from like one area or one phone, in essence. That's what we're shooting nice. for. Well, cool. Good luck on that. That's exciting. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. it again, you know, it could be two years before we bring it out because we're just that uh, tough on ourselves before we release it. But one of the worst things you can do is release a product and then, you know, a month later, call it all back to say, well, we made a mistake. We, we forgot hey, something. So we, we, a, we, test, we test, we test. We had a question from chat. So how long do those Guardian units last? Uh, those have the replaceable Guardian. probes, I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. they have a replaceable uh, pH probe. The EC or PPM probe is non-replaceable, but I will tell you, those just don't go bad. What they need is a good cleaning. We get them back periodically, and the, the office down in New Zealand cleans them up, and they work fine. Uh, the pH probes, on average, we've already talked about, last about two years. So the Guardian, I have Guardians out there now that are 8 and 10 years old. So there's no short-term uh, aspect to it. It's a definitely a long-term venture. That's awesome. Yeah. That's if you compare to that to eight years worth of testing for, for bottles, that, that would be cheaper for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very reliable. Guardians are, are one of our good sellers as well. They're just that good. Oh, yeah. I've used Guardians. I have Guardians in most of the aquaponics systems I've set up. And in the brew tanks, I like to know what the total PPMs are in my brew tank, as well as the pH, because that also factors in. Nice. Um, Absolutely. Um, we had another person ask what the P appropriate pH should be for aquaponics. Um, if you're doing aquaponics, you want it between 6.4 and 6.8. Um, you know, if you could put your finger on it, you want to keep it at 6.6. .6. But anything in that 6.4 to 6.8 range is perfectly fine. Um, if you get a little bit below that, you're going to start having some issues. It also can be a little bit rough on certain fish species. Right. Uh, you're also going to get, you know, when you get pH real low, you have no alkalinity left, and you can actually start to get swings in your pH. You know, if you're seeing a daytime to nighttime large pH change, you know, your alkalinity is definitely too low, and that might be time to buffer with a, with a bicarbonate or something like that. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of the range you're looking for is, you know, that 6.4 to 6.8. Which is another good argument for having a, a probe. Right. Like they can monitor in the middle of the night, because unless you're going to wake your ass up and go out to the fucking fish tank at three o'clock in the morning, you're not going to know what the pH is at three o'clock in the morning. So <clears throat> obviously, um, you know, having a constant probe in there where you can wake up the next day and check your app or, uh, you know, the readouts to see what your, you know, at least what your highs and lows are to be able to monitor those. But, um, you know, I feel like it's a it's a big difference and you know way more of a necessity for larger grows for sure um but but definitely if you want to get something extremely dialed in you got to know what's happening and you know and you're only going to know that from a probe unless you're going to test yourself every however often you want a result but with a probe you can get you know constant results if you want them well that means you can be laying in bed and reach over on your nightstand and check it from bed you know Instead of getting up in the morning, if it's, you got a probe in there and you got this app, you just turn on your phone when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can check your pH. Right. Even for those people that test their system every day with drops, for instance, you know, you still have, you know, if you had some type of crash in the middle of the night, for instance, you're still not even going to know until, you know, sometime the next day. So, right. You know, you're still rather than being able, you know, to set a threshold and get notified or be able to check in more often because you don't have to be there, especially if you're, you know, uh, not obviously, you know, living at wherever you're growing, you're going to go home at some point, right? 
So, uh, you know, for commercial operations, you know, I would think that having that kind of access would, you know, m more than offset the cost uh, of having it, especially in with the reservoir solutions, because like you was saying, you can monitor such a large reservoir um, with a single piece of equipment. So yeah, that, that's really hard to argue with, in my opinion. Dan, I was curious about, Marty said something that made me think, and, you know, sometimes I, I'm not sure, like Steve said earlier, or did we go over this already, but it, when you got those type probes, is there any of those that have actual, have an alarm so that if you're, like, say you're using that last device you just started that's paired with an Android, does it have an alarm if your pH or something gets out of, out of bounds? This does not. This is the pulse. It does not. It, um, We'll give you the the reading in a red or a uh, black. Black being I'm in where the range I want. Black oh, okay. or red being that I'm out. Now to be more specific, we do have say a guardian or a guardian connect. Right. That will alarm. You set a range for what you want of all your your pH, your ppm, and your temperature. And if any of those get out of alignment, get too high or too low, you can have it sent right to your phone and it's going to then give you a push notification or an alarm to let you know I've got a problem and that can be really as long as you have connection or ability to have Wi-Fi uh, you can get that anywhere you are so you can that's be in cool. Florida that's and cool. still yeah. know what's going on in Colorado yeah so get a phone call hey yo, uh, you're <laughs> look at your pH <laughs> or Oklahoma <laughs> looking at you Steve yeah, or Oklahoma <laughs> 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 so how did you end up over in new zealand or you know or where you live because you said are you on this side and you definitely don't have don't appear to be an australian or new zealander so no, no, no. You, i live in where pittsburgh, are you, from pennsylvania. you what i'm sorry i live in pittsburgh pennsylvania i've been in horticulture 31 years i um started off with a company out of canada that grew perennials and I was their only US sales rep. And I grew that to where I was their uh, their US sales manager. And then I left there and went to work for Proven Winners, which is the largest plant brand in the US. And stayed with them, left, went to work for the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, doing the same thing, licensing and, and uh, brand management. And eventually, and now I'm here. In the, in the cannabis world. I could see what was coming and I knew I wanted to be part of this. So, uh, and it's, it's a great industry. I guess part of what I was asking too is, but how did you get hooked up with the company in New Zealand? Uh, I, I kn knew somebody that was already part of the company and they approached me and said, hey, you, you know, we oh. need another rep in the, in the Northeast. All the other, there's only three of us to cover the US and uh, that they all live in California and none of them will like to come to the Northeast because yeah. they, if, if it snowed, they stayed inside. They wouldn't go anywhere. You know, when, when I got a call, I said, yeah, absolutely. I'll come out and I'll take a look at this company. And they, I met with the people in California and then they flew me down to New Zealand and I've been here now about five years. So it's, uh, it's been a great ride so far and I'm expecting it to continue. Cool. Cool. Yeah. By the way, I've been to Pittsburgh. Steve's from Philly, but I, I lived in Northwest Pennsylvania for a few years and pretty interesting up there. I love the alligator. Yeah, I like, yeah, I like PA at times. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything, anybody else in chat have any questions, Steve, or who's monitoring the chat for us there? Um, or for Darren here? Yeah. One second, sorry, I had to use the restroom a second here. So. Um, there are no other questions in chat. Um, is there anything else you wanted to, to mention here before we uh we switch gears? Uh, I think I've told you everything I can tell you at this juncture, yeah, but uh, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Steve knows how to get a hold of me, so uh, yeah, don't hesitate. I'll be, I, I talk to all kinds of people. The only time I won't pick up my phone is when I'm in doing a training with with you know a store or some people, but other than that, I'll get back to you pretty quick. Cool. That's good to know. 
I may have some questions down the road because uh, be re I'm trying to reopen this year and I'll have to be, I, I'm not going to, I'm sure that my other equipment's getting on the last days and stuff and I, it's time to revamp and especially if I go to aquaponics because there'll be several different tanks. You know, it sounds like those guardians, like Steve said, it sounds like that's the way to go. You know, I'd like to have something that yeah. Wi-Fi's to my computer, or just, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, they're very reliable. Um, for anybody that's listening, if you haven't tried Blue Lab, give us a shot because mm. it's uh, we're, we're number one in the industry. We're not a you know, we're not a hard sell company. We know you'll eventually come to us, uh, and then you won't leave because you'll you'll end up loving it. So just give it an opportunity. Really have a very good success uh, with your. Program. Yeah, the truncheon's probably been one of the top sellers for years that I know of. You know, I was trying to think. I don't think I've ever like encountered somebody that was like, "Oh, my blue lab pin's a piece of junk, and I threw it away, and I went back." You know, like every time I hear somebody bagging on a pH pin, it's some like, you know, twelve dollar Amazon special. So you know, I don't. You know, I've and I've definitely had a lot of people that use them, and I have a friend here locally actually that has the. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the Guardian Connect because he can look at it on his computer, which I think you were saying was the yeah. the upgraded model. So, um, yes. but uh, yeah, and he's been extremely happy with it. So, kudos. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I can't now. I can't wait to share it with the people on the forum. I'll put you in our Thanks buyer's guide, we got buyer's guide it. section. I'll, I'll, I'll go and look at your site and look at your new stuff that you got. And uh, everybody's doing everything from a phone. So even though it's not, didn't sound like a, you know, the, the pairing of the phone wasn't like what, you know, my favorite thing, but there's tons of people on my forum that would love that. If they could put a probe like that in their, in their, in their garden, and then check it on their phone while they're at work. I mean, that would just, that's, that's just a really good selling point right there. Well, okay. you, you wouldn't be able to do it from work because it's Bluetooth. So it only works up to about 35 oh. feet. But when they get back to it, they can check it. And you need to be able to actually push this button to take a reading. So it's not a continual read. It's just periodic reading when you press that button. Oh, okay. So for somebody, yeah, for somebody that's grow, you know, a, a big commercial grower that has a lot of uh, geraniums or, you know, any kind of annuals, perennials, shrubs that they have these massive, you know, 200, 300 acre grows of different products. Right now, what they're doing is they go out and I have a grower down in South Jersey uh, over to Best Nurseries. He has 175 acres of annuals, perennials, and shrubs. He was employing one guy full time to go around and mix slurries up. And if you've ever made a slurry, it's a pain in the ass because it's time consuming. You have to mix it up. You got to leave it sit for so long. Then you come back and you check it. Well, he saw this and he said, this will eliminate the guy's job because now I'm I can buy one for each section grower. I'll get twice as much or more information and I'll be able to record it versus this one guy he's paying to go around and mix these slurries up. Um, you know, it, it just isn't worth it. When you see something like this, you go, oh my God, where have you been all my life? So you jump on it and, uh, and, and that's what we're experiencing. People are seeing the benefits, the ease of use and, and the rapid aspect of getting you know real-time data right now okay i'm glad i misunderstood so we clarified that a little bit yeah absolutely i'm glad i was able to do that all righty well uh, why don't you tell everybody one last time how to get a hold of you and, and what your website is and um and uh thanks for joining us yep our website is bluelab.com uh, or you can go to getbluelab.com, and then from there you can actually purchase products. I tell everybody, though, go through your local hydro store <clears throat> because the distributors are going to give a better price, and the stores are going to give a better price. And if you go if you go on our webpage, you're going to pay full retail. Um, but if you need to reach me, you feel free to. I'm at Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, at bluelab.com. That's pretty easy to remember. Awesome. Thanks so much yeah, for joining us and getting us on uh, continuous testing and uh, electronic testing. I know most of us have used your stuff and it was just kind of cool. I'm trying to inform there's a lot of newer growers and stuff out there and, it, and think, you know, really good to, to get them uh, on the right path. So thanks for joining us.
My pleasure. I'm gl glad you had me and I enjoyed it very much. Thanks, Steve. Thanks to all you guys out there too as well. Appreciate it. The time. Yeah. Well, Thank we you. also ask you to hang out if you want to. We we don't have, we're not saying you got to leave. You're welcome to take off or you're welcome to stay hang out whichever you want to do. So. I appreciate it, but I, you know what? I haven't eaten yet, so I got to go eat something. <laughs> all right. Enjoy your meal. Thanks for well, coming. Thank you right. so much, Great, nice. great thank meeting you. Great product out there, Blue Lab. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Have a great evening. You too. Good night. Good night. Oh, that was a lot of fun. Um, I think uh, next I want to talk about, we had a really good time, and there's lots of people in chat and everything that have been were there as well. Um, uh, Josh had a chance to, to throw on one of the best events, if not the best event I've ever been to for cannabis uh, up in Vancouver. It was a really kick-ass time. Um, why don't you tell everybody how that went and uh, and uh, how they can get involved. There's three more coming up, and, um, and we want to make sure uh, people can, can share the knowledge as well. Yeah, no, super dope. Um, it's cool because it's kind of uh, just the nature of the industry and where everyone's at right now. Um, Californians really got their asses handed to them in the last year um, just going through legalization you know it's the same story that we've been talking about in this, this the situation that I've experienced but you know California is a big state it's a lot of growers and obviously they have a you know concentration so um, we just we had a lot of talk of that and, and the, 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 a lot of the, the talks just kind of shifted towards supporting each other and coming together as a community and um, recognizing that, you know, we, we, we've always, we've kind of been in the past, it's been like, oh, this is my, this is my, these are my genetics. This is my secret. You know, I'm not going to tell, tell anybody else because it's my little corner on the market that I have to sell my flower or whatever, you know? Um, and, and those days are gone because our, our real competitors are the big, big, big mega corporations like Marlboro, how much did they invest in Canada, into Canada? It was like a couple billion. Um, so those are the guys that we're competing against. And, and really the best thing we could do um, is to, to co cooperate and make cooperatives and, and pull together um, to sell and grow and, and purchase, you know. So that was kind of a re reoccurring theme uh, that, that came out. Um, it was real good to have uh, the BC Bubble Man um, and Mike West. And um Oh shoot! I'm tripping on the other dude's name from from Whistler Medino Medicinals. Do you remember his name, Steve? Uh, Mike West. Dan Daniel Daniel. Um, oh, uh, Daniel. Um, his last name. Hold on. I'll get it for you. But uh, yeah, he's he's from Whistler Medicinals, and uh, they had a great uh, talk on Friday night about um, concentrates and uh, you know the the need for quality resin. You know, sort of setting the stage for you know sun grown. Uh, regenerative cannabis um, so that and was mike, really exciting mike baker maybe no it was mike west and then mike uh west. yeah daniel and, uh, uh, what was his name uh, from pacific northwest roots uh kaya kaya, so kaya. kaya come, came out and hung out all weekend and it was super super awesome to meet him we got to get him on the show he's a he's an old school head and he's got a lot of history um in the cannabis industry and he's got some really cool genetics. Um, his his trade one, his kind of main one, is the coffee guy's coffee, and uh, it was cool. We got uh, we all went we went to uh, tour um, uh, shoot embark. That's what it's called. Uh, yep. BC gotcha. Bubble Man's new uh, uh, venture, and it's it's insane. Our our jaws were dropped. You know, the, yeah. the ability they're building this place, and they will have the ability to process ten thousand pounds plus a day of cannabis and uh, every which way, you know, processing and done, you know, to the nth degree, you know, I, I think I can't even remember the, the cost he was quoting something like $80,000 uh, for freeze, freeze dryers, two of them for making hash. Um, but uh, it, that, that they could essentially process our, our entire state here in Washington, um, our yearly harvest in about a week with those numbers so you, you hear about things like that happening and it really puts you in check and you're like oh man like maybe i need to pool together with all these other guys who have been like kind of in my competition you know and we need to work together and because we, we are craft cannabis as a whole but we you know we need to we need to join together sorry i can go on and on about it 
Yeah, there's some, but, um, some real big stuff in the works that him and I cannot talk about that are, are you guys are going to really like later down the line. Yeah, it's really cool, really cool stuff. Um, the Dillich, we can say that the Dempure uh, network is, is is getting together and, and rallying, you know, and it's a pretty beautiful thing. So, yeah, we had a great Dempure night. Uh, we had Dempure panel night uh, Saturday night. I was on the board. I'm recently... Uh, certified Dempure farmer. I'm excited about that. Super proud to be a part of that. Yeah. Thank Congratulations, you. by the way. That yeah. was a lot of hard work. Yeah, it's it's just nice to. I mean, it's stuff that I've stuff that I've been was have been doing. Um, but it's just nice to like have that acknowledgement and uh, to be a part of uh, a team and uh, there there you know it's it's more than just a certification. You know, you can't buy it. I think they've talked about it on the show before, but you can't buy it. It's peer uh, certified. P-E-E-R, peer um, certified. So other farms, farmers came to my, my farm and walked through and asked questions. And, you know, it's, so it's kind of an ongoing accountability thing, but also connection, you know, where we, we can, you know, just, just exactly the stuff I was talking about. We can connect, we can ask questions to each other, what, you know, share beans and seeds that, that have, have worked historically in different regions. Um, it's a cool network and, and, you know, Josh and Kelly are, are working on uh, making that network into a, you know, a marketing marketable deal where we could actually, you know, once the, um, the federal laws change, you know, we could actually sell weed internationally uh, and pull together as Dempure farmers. Um, so that that's pretty exciting. Well, I thought it was cool what what Kelly said too on the show last about a month ago at when she told you you were going to be certified and uh, and you basically didn't do anything you weren't already doing. They just found out what you were doing and certified you because you were already, because there's like, why don't you explain that to people again? Because if I recall, there was like several points that you have to do, be cert, you have to do five of them to be certified out of. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, a bunch to it. So it's an above uh, an organic certification. So if you think of all the things in organic certification, those apply. Um, but then he goes further into testing, you know, yes, uh, heavy metals uh, testing in the soil, um, residual pesticide testing of the soil, which, you know, believe it or not, is not required in uh, organic certification. Um, and then uh, you have to have six closed loops. That's a big one. You know, a closed loop being, yeah. diff- you know, ways where you're, you know, maybe you, you feed chickens from your compost pile and then you eat those eggs, you know, so that's your, your you're closing a loop and you're not sending those eggs out or you're not, uh, you know, so you have to have six closed loops, you know, water catch, you have to have water catchment. Um, what else is the big ones? You have to grow your own food. Um, you can't use any BHO, um, no feminized seeds. Um, I have a question. A that. Is feminized yeah. if they're naturally feminized as in you over, um age them is that okay if you're not using any you know stimulants or hormonal treatments you know i think that the the main point is to is to discourage the the intention of feminizing with you know colloidal silver or um yeah right whatever else you know um i I haven't gone deep into them with that one but i I assume that that's really the the issue you know Um, because yeah seeds get seeds do get self under stressful situations and um, most of us have popped a, a seed out of a out of a bag, and most of us have found good weed out of that those seeds, you know. So, oh yeah, yeah. Um, conference was awesome. You know, we had a great day on Sunday too. Uh, I'm just kind of thinking of the the highlights, you know, for myself. And Sunday was a good day with Kevin Jodry. Uh, man, that guy is one hell of a dude. We got to get him on the show. Um, yeah, so he 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 said he's gonna come on the show. He's him, cool. Joshua Steensland. We got we got a um the, I forget what the woman's name that was speaking on genetics. Um, I think the biggest one of the coolest takeaways I got yeah. from the conference, the first one, was um uh, who was it? Was it Mike West or was one of the hash guys that said um about the cannabinoids that were only found in the presence of pathogens? Which I thought was incredible. So what what he was talking about in the in the in the talk that we were we were going on, and I you know it was really good. Um, I highly suggest going to the neuro conferences. Was um, in well, they found they did actually did cannabinoid testing on strains of the powdery mildew and had you know other pathogen problems with them. I don't I don't think it was powdery 
they'll do specific. I don't think he even got into specifics, but they actually tested stuff that had pathogens that normally you would trash. And what they found was those presence of those pathogens caused the creation of novel cannabinoids that are not found in clean products. So there are cannabinoids that are only found in the presence of certain path, uh, pathogens that might have medical benefits. Now imagine if we're intentionally infecting our plants with PM to make a cannabinoid that's particularly good against XYZ, you know, illness or, or, or you know, um, disease or, or condition. Um, that's a whole new realm that none of us have ever tried to work on or isolate because it seemed illogical at the time. And, and I think that's, you know, looking at how these things can alter the cannabinoid profiles and environment, but not just the microbials, but maybe even it would make sense. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm really pushing for a certain thing, this needs lots of research. There's, you know, who knows, but it's a whole new rabbit hole for can cannabis and cannabinoid production that no one's ever touched before. And I thought that was one of the coolest and one of the most awesome takeaways from the whole convention. It's something I had never thought of, but it makes perfect sense that the terpene profile would change with the presence of a pathogen. And remember, what is a cannabinoid? Cannabinoid is a terpene plus a phenyl. Um, and, and so, of course, if you change the ratio of your terpenes or the or the terpene expression because of a, the addition of a pathogen, absolutely that's going to change your, your, your cannabinoid profiles. So I, that was one of the coolest and most interesting things that I took away from that whole convention. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's really uh, trippy to see how far, you know, yeah, a lot, I don't know. A lot of us are in our own worlds a little bit with our own homies, you know, and um, we can get pretty big headed, but it's really trippy to see how far people go down the rabbit hole. You know, like all three of those guys had gone so far down the rabbit hole making hash. And then so what, what I was saying is when we went on that tour of Embark, we hopped, we all decided to go out to, to lunch afterward. And so we all piled in car and like these these three dudes piled in the back of the car with me and Kaya. And uh, we're just, we're rapping and all of a sudden they're busting out hash and like, we're talking and then we realize they're the, the Maple Butter Boys, these dudes we've seen on, uh, on um, the Bubble Man show. And I'm like, oh, oh, sick. And so we, they, and then they started busting out the Kaya's coffee. They had Kaya's coffee and flour. They had two or three finos. They had it in hash. And so like, by the time we got to lunch, we'd probably smoke two or three uh, doobies and like a bunch of hash. And Kaya was tripping the fuck out. He was just like so stoked, you know. It, it was, you know, F ones. <laughs> yeah, they, these guys had sifted from F ones way back in the day. But uh, the interesting work that they were doing, that uh, you, you don't get to talk to a lot Ooh. of guys that 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 run a ton of strains uh, testing, uh, you know, in different lighting conditions. Like they they had they had it down to like, oh, this strain like does better under HPS, and it pulls this way under led so we you know we use this one for led this one for hps and the, this one for metal halide with this one likes a spectrum like they were getting deep in it you know it wasn't just like these are hash strains over here it was like we you know they're going all different ways and um it was it's just super interesting to see people specialize in really cool shit you know a lot of times when you when we've hear, heard about people specializing it's usually in like auto flowers or something like that you know that's kind of just like yeah cool dude you like autumn flowers the other the other big thing i took away was learning about how many first off especially with the the trichomes and, and veg absorbing sprays but also the fact that the a lot of sprays say, per slow down and say that, say, that, and, say that say that slower because so people understand it sure so okay um uh, i learned there a lot of your sprays because you have the different the three different trichome sizes these smaller trichomes actually develop in veg, which is a lot of your CBD production and things, things like that, which we've talked about previously on the show. But if you spray those in veg, they will absorb those essential oils and those pesticides and actually go into the trichome head itself. And, and if you're using sprays in veg and then flipping and thinking you're okay because you only use them in veg and all that new vegetative growth and everything you're harvesting off of that hasn't been fully replaced since you sprayed last, you absolutely will get pesticide testing a residue use, um, that will cause you problems and can potentially ruin your hash depending on the quality you're looking to go for. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so that was a big takeaway. You know, I didn't realize it would stay in the plant that long. Um, so that was a really big eye-opener as well as far as hash making and, 
I think the other really big eye opener one was getting a chance to smoke with and then go get my groove on with one of the um, uh, cannabis nuns from Sacramento. That uh, I think it was Saturday night. That was a lot of fun. Um, got a chance to meet the uh, those nuns down there. You guys probably seen them on the news or whatever. Oh um, yeah, they grow cannabis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got a chance to meet them in Vancouver. That was a lot of fun. So that they got was, their own business going. <laughs> yeah. I saw, uh, um, we saw. Um, uh, what's his name from Optic Foliar? I'm drawing a blank. We smoked a Dinesh. Little earlier. Dinesh, thank you. Dinesh. Um, saw Dinesh from Optic Foliar. Um, saw Orr from Spectrum King. He was up there. I didn't see him. He should have popped in. I didn't. See yeah, him. I um, uh, um, yeah. He was just super busy. He was working the floor. So, um, who else did I see up there? All kind, you know, a couple of other people that uh, you guys have seen on the show. Um, it was really interesting to see. A, um, I also popped over to Lift Expo as well. Uh, and it was kind of neat to see a, a Canadian expo. It was a little bit different. <coughs> it was a lot more subdued, I would say. And there was a lot less um, cannabis um, cannabis celebrities or, or people that, I guess, are more well-known in the industry. It was a lot more suits than I have seen at any other show before, which was a little bit concerning. But other than that, um, it was interesting. I got a chance to actually jam out with the guys from Green Relief. And uh, talk to their current head grower, which was always entertaining. Um, and uh, what else was going on up there? I worked with them. For those of you guys that don't know, I worked with them back when they were first getting started. Um, what else is going on? Uh, I think that was most of it for the trip. The trip was really awesome. Had a hell of a good time hanging out with Bubble Man, getting a tour of his spot, hanging out over at um, uh, Friday night when we went over to uh, Dragonfly Earth Medicine's place. Um, they had a place in town and a uh, party with Tara Lee's and the uh, and chat here, she was over there dabbing everybody out with some real good concentrates. Bubble Man was there. Josh and Kelly were there. Um, we had uh, all different kinds of really awesome people there just jamming out, sharing good information, and having a real good time. Um, Got to be some of my favorite people on earth to hang out with and spend time with. Just nothing but positive vibes from them. And always a good time. So. Yeah, and you should see the flower that those guys grow up in northern uh, BC outdoors it's beautiful <coughs> um yeah I, we, I went I went round and round you know they have a ton of flavors and, and I would just I probably had two or three sessions just like looking at the jars with Josh you know oh yeah a good time they have oh man this I was so excited this uh skunk from uh Dom, is it it's is it Dominion Duke Diamonds brand which brand is his what's his brand uh, I forget. It's du it's I'm Duke Diamond. Friend. It's Duke Diamond. Um, I, I may have mis said what seed company it is, but it's Duke Diamond's Skunk. And uh, holy fuck! Like I I I I'm blown away. That 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 is probably the strain of the year for me that I've smelt that I I'm like super super jealous of. <laughs> you know, um, I and I don't do not say that lightly. I'm usually not jealous of other people's weed, but this was like. Whoa, and it's straight outdoors, so fucking skunky with this like lime in the back. Like, I just kept hitting it, and, and I was like, Josh is looking at me, I was like, Yeah, it's super complex, dude. And I just kept hitting it, you know. That you know, I, I didn't smoke it, I was just smelling the jar, <laughs> but I was just intoxicated by it. So, if you get a chance, you should go buy those beans. Um, I'm gonna try to get some because uh, it was phenomenal. I uh, it was really I'll nice to look at some old I'll school Renee this. too. I haven't smoked Renee probably in five or six years, and it was real nice to smoke some of that again. Yeah, the Renee, it's it is Dominion seeds. I said it right. Um, so go check him out. But yeah, yeah, we had a microbe, uh, microbe herder brought us all a bunch of fire. Go check him out on on Instagram. He um he's a soil food web consultant with Dr. Elaine uh, Ingham. And he had some blood orange tangy. He had that Renee. Um, there was another, another. He gave us like four or five different flavors. Violator Kush, I really liked. Um, hash plant. Whoa, that one was really awesome. Like the real BC hash plant. That was cool to see and smoke. So yeah, we were blessed. A lot of people brought a lot of good herb out to share. I was worried that we wouldn't have it have enough, but. Um, Los Gardens, LOS Gardens, Sean brought some fuck, fucking fire, a bunch of hash. That was super cool of him. When you bring the knowledge, man, you need not want not. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. So, yeah. No, so really Humble looking coming forward up. to Humble. Humble's coming up. Yeah. 20 February 22nd, 23rd, 24th. That's going to be a real good time. Um, readers, Humble's we're gonna different. Have, we're going to have me. Humble's, <laughs> a Humble's a different vibe, too, because you have – there's nowhere else to go, so everyone kind of stays together, and it's a little more social than some of the other meets. And where, what's the closest airport to there? You know, uh, the, the closest is probably not the best, or in our opinion, me and Layton's. We choose to fly into San Francisco now. Um, seems to work out a little bit better. So it's a little bit of a drive, but we tried uh, Santa Rosa. We tried Sacramento, and that was a pain in the ass. And then uh, Arcata is a little too expensive, and it's a really tiny airport. And like you could, they, they ran out of cars before, so it was you know it can be problematic. Yeah, we had one of the, we had we had Doctor and Doctor uh, Efren um, had to rent a, a like a U-Haul to get to the conference because there was no more rental cars. <laughs> so go San Francisco. Well, plenty of room to collect. Stop on the side of the road and collect some fungi, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like oh, him a lot. He's a blast, man. We have a we. Yeah, I got to get some more secrets out of him. That's for sure. <laughs> I was I was gonna say uh, just to, just to wrap up real quick, we can move on. But um, in Redway, I'm really excited because in, in the Breeders, uh, well, first off, Friday night we're gonna be joined, and uh, BC Bubble Man won't be able to join us because he's just not comfortable leaving Canada or not leaving Canada. He's not comfortable coming to the United States, and I don't blame him. So um, he can't come up and join us. But we got. Um, uh, Frenchy Cannoli, and so I'm really excited to have him Friday night to to talk hash with us, and then uh, on Sunday uh, for breeders we 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 still got a couple more to lock down, but I know we're gonna have uh, Mean Gene um, from Freeborn Selection, and uh, he is real legit. He was he was on the panel last year, and uh, yeah, so um, also gonna have uh, Elena from Green Fire Genetics, and she's got some really cool stuff. Her rainbow pie looks phenomenal, and I really want to get some of that. Um, but she just got a write-up in Skunk Magazine on that. So um, those what? two guys. Oh, okay. And then uh, also Eric from uh, HBK Genetics. Big shout-out to him. Um, he um, won actually two two of his strains won the Emerald Cup this year. His, um, wow. Chili Verde, his Chili Verde won the personal use, um, which is super cool. You know, that's kind of – as I, you know, I think about it and understand it, it's, you know, the highest cat- category, the, the best flower, you know, personal use. Someone can put more. Really is. And then the, the next kind of level would be mixed, mixed light uh, commercial and his um, Green Hornet won that one. So big shout out to him. And uh, he's a really cool dude. Um, I've got, got, got to know him a little bit over the last year and super humble and he, he, he breeds some super fire fire stuff down down in uh, the central valley where it's hot and dry um so part part of why we're doing the genetics thing is really to to let people get to know breeders and to get to know what they're doing it for you know why they're doing it what environment they're doing it in what they're selecting for um so that when you are going to make your selection you're buy your seeds you're not just buying what's hype you know because it might not be what works well in your situation but you you can make some really solid choices you know um at the emerald cup i don't know if i talked about this on the show before but uh i got to meet bobby snodgrass and uh he's in southern oregon um snodgrass family genetics and he had some of the best flower i have ever seen and it was all straight outdoor no covers full term um just fucking beautiful flower and i've seen i've seen it time and time again and it's it's really just about finding the genetics that are going to work in your situation and then you can succeed with with ease and you don't need a bunch of bullshit so i'll get off my horse (laughs) yeah and anyone that's wants to really learn more uh on cannabis regardless of your growth method definitely come out and learn how to do it right from just the best that, that there is out there you know, the, the list of people that Josh has put together really is unparalleled for any other conference out there it's for education. So you know, if, you, if you're a big fan of that, come out and support it. I hear, uh, you know, they may or may not have, uh, <coughs> they'll have all these, uh, uh, you know, three other events so far. 
There may or may not even be an online ticket here, depending on technical issues that we're, we're working out at, at, while we're working on this. So, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out here soon. But, uh, you know, be, be sure to come out, especially for, for the next couple, um, you know, make sure you come out and support the group. Um, what have you been up to uh, in your garden there, Josh? Anything? Or have you just been too busy with all this? No, I got – so I got home early – Monday and hung out with my son for the day and then Tuesday I rented an excavator and uh, was on that for 12 hours um, have I did I tell you guys about I, I had trenched around my greenhouse um, to create two for two reasons one to create drainage of all the water coming off the greenhouse and then two to put insulation around the greenhouse so I, I put that insulation in and then uh, hay bales, and uh, when you when you were there, Steve, it was just a wreck. And so, I I got this excavator today and and finished the job and cleaned it all up and got everything covered up and put back together. So, I'm one step closer to being back in action in my greenhouse. That feels really good. Um, next uh, next week, I gotta put my uh, radiant floor heat system together. I got the tubes in the ground, but I gotta plumb it all together and kind of figure that out and then uh then i'm going to be ready to go so yeah that's what's going on with me and i, I got to get my moms in there big time because clone orders are starting to come in and uh yeah i'm excited cool yeah what about you roger what have you been up to in your garden uh hold on oh i do have my mic on i'm sorry i didn't think i had it on i was looking at airline flights to san francisco um because i'd really like to come to that one but you know instead of, i don't know i might have to wait till michigan um really just um i just had a i i, I just got i just cut down some clones that i had been messing with some really weird blue dream that that um <laughs> it it when I took the clone, I flowered the, the mother it came from and everything was fine. Then I took the clone and I was vegging everything under a long photo period under my T5s, all the, all the cuttings I had taken. And these started flowering like in this two weeks after I, after it rooted, you know, and, uh, and I was kind of freaked out. And I think I, I don't remember because I just do whatever I do when I do it. I don't write everything down, but I think I, I think I just did the lights 24 and zero, which I don't generally recommend, but I put it all the way to 24 zero, um, 24 lights on continuously for about a week or so. And then I didn't really like the looks of the plants all the way through growing and all, but I tell you what, I just got my first, it's been five days. I got my first taste of a little bit that was a little on the dry, you know, it was kind of dry enough to try last night and oh my god it it was worth growing all i can say is but it's a real strange looking plant it had uh it's almost as if the um the plant kicked all the indica genetics out of the strain out of the hybrid you know it's it's like it went total freaking sativa and it had had has kind of longish you know colas that are just calyxes and there it's the odd shaped buds there's no tight super tight dense bud it's just calyxes and oh man i tell you what uh, just, yeah it came out really really good i i made sure i flowered it extra long too um a little bit longer than some people would do i let it, i just let i've gotten i've gotten kind of patient you know all the through the years i always tried to be patient but you always wanted to try to get something as soon as you thought something was ready but now I just sit there and let it keep flowering and then uh, it'll be, you know, another week, there'll be two weeks. So that was kind of an interesting thing. I wish I had some pictures to show you because it was a very odd uh, bud formations on this. But uh, but I'm happy. I'm happy. I didn't get a ton of yield from it either because of the bud formation the way it was. But And I, I wouldn't continue to do that because, you know, my space is valuable to me and it has to last for so long or I'm out, I run out of medicine. But um I got some real interesting things. I, I got a real good sniff. Of, um, I had a. I'm trying to think what. Let me see. Yeah, this is the first one. I had them when I popped. I popped a Maui Wowie seed a while back, and it. And after I took the clone and was rooting the clone, the mother died. Just, just died. Just something. I don't know what happened. So, I had to wait, and it took me a long time. I had these things in like 
in under t5s for months you know just crazy and keep them in small pots and um they none, none of them because i guess because of the method i do with the way i'm watering them uh they they none of them got really unbelievably they didn't get totally root bound you know which is kind of crazy and i repotted well i stuck my face in the maui wowie last night and like it's kind of what josh was saying is about that one strain that he kept sticking his face in the jar I, I I got five different flavor sensations, you know, out of that one one big nose head off of off of the top of the plant, and I'm looking forward to that. I've never had it; it's an old classic strain kind of deal, and uh, I'm really looking for. I'm glad I was able to get some beans for that, and I'm really look. I'm really excited about it now that I smelled it last night. If I can just if I can just keep the terpene levels up, right, Steve? You know, you actually had a, a question from chat. Roger, somebody asked, um, we, where can they find the yeah? Where can they find the the test results for gold leaf? That, you know, they said a couple of uh, episodes back, you said there was a it was like a 2020 strain, and you wanted to know if you could find a, a test result for that. Um, I don't know of any because uh, you know I'm in the less than legal area, and everybody I know that that that, that that's why I'm sending it. Oh, and by the way, I, I just inject real quick. I bought a new printer so I can finally get my labels printed you guys would so i'm sending it to friends in places where it can be tested once it's once it's grown and they're very good at what they do so i'm sure that we'll get some really good results here in the next few months because those those i've got two friends out west that are going to be getting some and um and then what that i'm sure they'll come out with a good result and then we'll be able to get it tested maybe that way you know uh as far as that is, the uh, test results are in the warehouse and in the, in the uh, lab in in Amsterdam, I suppose. You know, I don't see any published test results on that. I've just seen what the what uh, our our company founder wrote about it, and I actually believe I, I got to go look at it. I, I can't remember because things uh, we've gone through a lot of changes with our genetics in our store for the last year or so. We still sell that, still have that big time. Everybody that grows it loves it. That's I can say that much. I haven't had one complaint. And actually, what made me get some of those seeds originally was watching everybody on the forum at I Love Growing Marijuana, and and watching them, you know, like they're they're showing their grow journal and they're growing gold leaf. And I mean, you got fat indica kind of leaves, and it's just squat and bushy and looks, you know, really strong genetics. So. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a specific. I will look into that to see if I can find out because I'm, I you know, I'm fairly high up on the company ladder there. I probably can get an answer of some sort about the uh, availability of possibly so where they, you know, because I can ask them where they got their tested so that they came up with their, their, um, you know, whatever testing facilities there would be in the Netherlands as I'm sure what where they got that from. You know, I don't think that the, I, I could be wrong. They, you know, Robert might have testing equipment in his own lab, you know, because things are different in Europe than it is here too, you know. You know some, a lot of things are easier to come by. Some things are harder to come by. Uh, but I'll, I'll ask for you. I'm sorry I don't have an answer. I will ask. Uh, I'll try to remember to shoot them an email this week and see if they can at least uh, fax me or, or, or attach a, a file so I could give you some, let you know at least where they had it tested. You know, but as far as test results, it's it's somewhere in Europe. So, you know, that makes it a little more difficult sometimes. Because let's face it, most people don't realize this because we're talking about Amsterdam and all, but it's illegal there too. You know, you can't hear you, Steve. You're muted. They tolerate it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, they tolerate it there big time, especially if you live there. I heard rumors that, you know, that's kind of funny to segue over here. I heard rumors of last year or so that that they had passed some laws where when you went to coffee shops, if you weren't a resident, you couldn't smoke pot in there anymore. Now, I've, I, I find it hard to believe that they're going to totally wipe out their tourist trade. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, so I don't know. I've been wanting to go there. I've been working with the company almost five years, and we had talked about it when I got hired. We talked about a trip, you know, over there, and I'd still like to go, but I'm super busy, and, I, you know, I don't have anybody here to watch my place if I do go. 
and they were going to bring me over for a week. But the company has grown so big and keeps go doing more and more and more and providing more services and and um, and uh, and marketing and their marketing's grown. And everybody's gotten so freaking busy, you know. Like you know, no, I, I don't know. It's funny. Like people in the office go, "Well, I, I'm I won't be. I'll be back in two weeks." I'm like, "Wow, I wish I could leave for two weeks." <laughs> <laughs> but uh i'll get I'll, again i'll try to get you a, i'll find out where the where the results came from uh but but meanwhile there are some of those genetics making their way to the west coast and i do, i know that the people that are getting them have access to testing facilities so maybe we can find out that way i actually asked a guy today um where i'm at if he could do a uh um you know uh, uh, testing for out-of-state people, and he said he wasn't sure he was going to get back. So as soon as like, he's, he might come on the show and talk about testing. Um, these companies going to do, I believe it's 50 terpenes and uh, I think 14 cannab or 20 cannabinoids. It's a lot, way more than I've heard before. Uh, they're based here in Oklahoma. Um, actually, I'm in Oklahoma at the moment. I'm working with some grows. You guys can follow my Instagram or anything. Um, you guys have seen a couple of pictures. Um, uh yeah it's, it's a lot of fun it's a interesting to be in a very virgin market that wow <laughs> is a, a very new to the cannabis culture and growing and licensing and the whole it's it's been quite a what an interesting experience um but uh working with some clients out here it's gonna be a lot of fun uh we'll have a, a bunch of really awesome footage and build footage and a whole bunch of cool stuff going on out here I'll be bouncing between here and another place, like two other places. Um, I was up in Canada last week working, uh, doing the conference, but also uh, talked with some uh, producers up there. Um, so we'll have some some things going on up in Canada. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, you know, uh, a lot of cool content coming up. To show a lot of cool things. I wish I could mention right now that I I sworn to secrecy on. Here we but, go. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, but it's okay. A lot of this stuff won't be secret very long. A lot of this stuff is going to be unwrapped here in the next you know, one to four months that I can start to really talk about. So, um, yeah, basically what I've been up to the last month and a half, two months, has been under wraps. And uh, I'll see some cool stuff coming out here before too long. <clears throat> um, especially if you live in it. Well, I'll hold my tongue for now. Um, but, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, interesting working with, with a couple of these different producers and uh, educating people. Um, just doing the whole gamut right now. It's been a lot of, a lot of fun, uh, definitely different, but, uh, you know, a lot of fun, you know, uh, educating. So. I would say you, you mentioned about your friend asking about testing. It's still federally illegal. So at this point, so I very seriously doubt he's be willing to be having somebody illegally break federal law to get tested. But. You never know. We've had, a. We've mentioned one or two places before on the show and previous episodes where you could mail it in. Uh, there was a lab out of California that was all you know, readily doing it. I think I mentioned them once or twice in the previous episodes. What did it cost? Um, it depends. You know, most of your, your potency testing is going to run 50 to 75. I know the full testing, which was full gamut pesticide, terpene, cannabinoids, and um, solvent residue was 420 bucks. I think it was. So... Wait, what did you say the first one was? 35? 50 to 75. 75, wow. I can't remember which for, for cannabinoids. Terpenes. So, cannabinoids. So, we're, like, uh, we're like 120 for the California, baseline. California is 50 bucks for terpenes, 125 for um, ter or 125 for terpenes, 50 for cannabinoids, and I forget what for pesticides and residue. But that that's SC Labs and the uh, uh, Infinity Labs, I think, were the two that I, you know, were right around those. Yeah, parts. no, you, it's it's like somewhere between eighty and a hundred bucks for base testing. That does not include terpenes. Add another fifty bucks, sixty bucks for terpenes. And so then that's if you the best price, want right? to do, yeah, if you want to do heavy metals or pesticide, that you're up to like a five hundred dollar. Oh, so that's which the is great, yeah. and that's and that's every five pounds of weed. So it's nuts, dude. You know. Yeah. How much do you, how much a sample do they require you to send? 
Uh, two grams or something. Uh, oh, okay. That, yeah. that, that, that's, that part is insignificant. It's, it's the, it's the cost that's, you know, it's the cost per pound that adds up so quickly, you know, when you're selling $500 pounds and it's a hundred, hundred fifty dollars to trim it and a hundred dollars to test it, it's it really hard to make money as a farmer. Yep. I know, um, I'm trying to remember what the guy said today on that. Anyway, I'll, 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 he'll be on the show, I think, here before too long. So. Well, there perhaps have, as the demand mobile, gets so, as it gets so mobile, big, go ahead. They have a mobile testing lab where they'll just show up to your farm and test it right there, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that would be something that might be a little less expensive too. You know, well, the thing is, it, what I was going to what I was going to say was, if I let me see, what was I going to say? Um, oh, as the you know, since this is really still, even though. I mean, this thing about testing and all is really kind of new. I mean, it's not new for commercial growers that were doing pharmacies and stuff in, say, Colorado or California through the years. But with the mass of recreational, you know, uh, and everything else where people are trying to form their own markets, uh, I think they're going to have to um, do better than that. I mean, what's your turnaround time, too? Because uh, I'm thinking of the logistics of it with a whole bunch more people. You think the price of testing would be coming down? Because they're pro male, the probably come down a lot. It used to be, you know, the base testing used to be two to three hundred dollars. I know I can remember even twenty fifteen it was like that. Okay, so see, it's doing that, and then you think about the fact that because it's there's going to be so much demand, there's going to be new companies open up with the whole idea is to make it affordable. Yeah, too, if you if you buy a thousand tests or a hundred tests or hundred and fifty tests or fifty tests even. Um, uh, and you, I know some places too will do a monthly subscription and for a subscription, you get up to X number of tests per month or whatever. Um, and you can do, you know, for, for businesses, if you're a grow cultivation, you have to have that for your legal testing anyway. And most States, um, you know, want it per, per 10 pounds or per five pounds or per 20 pounds, depending on the state. So, um, I, what's Washington. Sorry. What was the question? What what batch size do you have to do testing for? Oh, five pounds. Five pounds, yeah. Yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, when it, so it's if it's four or five hundred bucks, it's close to a hundred dollars per pound of test. Yeah. You know, hundred hundred twenty hundred fifty dollars to trim. You know, and you're down to three hundred bucks, and uh, this is why we need yeah. this is why we need migrant labor. We need people to trim our. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, no, what we need, what we need, we need is that what, what we need to do is like uh, not play those game with like the game with those prices. And uh, if there's not enough people in my in my state to support, you know, me growing a higher quality product and putting the extra effort into trimming and manicuring and curing and the whole process, then uh, maybe it needs to go somewhere else where people really want it. You know, you know, we buy champagne from champagne you know, France, like we buy these different things that are, that are really boutique that we're excited about from different regions because they're awesome. And, uh, so hope, hopefully that, uh, that'll happen soon. I, you know, I, I really think, you know, gonna, uh, that federal is going to change here soon. It's going to change. You know, I, I really think within the next six months to a year, hmm. that's my hope. Yeah, we all hope. I, I, I've been preaching to people every day because we get a lot of these people, like just today this or yesterday, this guy wanted, now here's a guy that doesn't know diddly squat about growing cannabis or anything else, and he comes on our forum and he wants us to teach him how to grow like, uh, or teach him how to do a, a another one of these giant commercial farms, Steve, like where I was talking about him, you know, and he wants it all, he wants to get all this information for free. You know, and, and he tells, yeah, because but I'm, we're going outdoors because it's the cheapest way. And I said, you know, all you people think you're just going to jump in this industry and make a million dollars. And you know what? I said, out in Cal I said, out in Washington, they they could barely get three or four hundred dollars a pound. You know, so just to let you know, just because it's legal and all of a sudden you can form a company, you might form that company. And I said, aside from that, growing outdoors, you got so many hoops to jump through. And especially if you're trying to do any medicine, you know, you're, you know, it's, they're so delusional. You know, it's, it's, I'm sure it's another investment banker, just like we, you know, we run across that all the time. Um, but 
you know, I, I use Josh's model as a, as a deterrent for people to do something stupid with their money. You know, if they're not prepared, because you know, say I got a friend that, you know, he put tons of work in and he's got all this. And then suddenly they do all this recreational and everything else in the med industries, you know, wacky now and, and all this high dollar product for medicine that he had. He, you know, he can't sell because there's so much, you know, recreational out there now. And at, or at, at the, at, you can sell it. You just keep it you know, compared to what you thought you were going to get your job to give it away. Right. Yeah. yeah well, people, um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, the, the, the people offer $300 a pound, $200 a pound. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I just told you, you know, trim and, and testing cost, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't work, but, but we're in a situation and it's, it's a problem of a new market that, that we all, you know, kind of knew that was going to happen. But, you know, for me personally, the way that it worked out, I wasn't able to get in soon enough. Some folks that were able to get in the very beginning made some good money um, and, and are able to stay in. And, and But everybody is hurting right now because there's so much weed and it's such a close system. And we haven't touched the black market. The black market thrives in Washington. Um, people don't come into our, into the, the, you know, the 502 recreational stores because it's, it's a mid scene, uh, and it's a, it's a, a new consumer base. And so these new consumers are going through the process that we all went through when we first started smoking weed, you know, you smoke weed mids for a long time, you know, and you're just stoked to be stoned and like, holy shit, you can go down and buy a vape pen for three dollars you can buy a joint for like two dollars you know if you go on the right day and you can get stoned for two dollars like that's awesome you know it used to be like 20 bucks minimum and you have to like wait for this dude and like it was all a bunch of bullshit like it'd take you six hours just to get stoned now you can just like go down to the store and it's you know it's not good pot but i don't know i'm ranting but it's it's the process of of a new market stabilizing. And, and right now we're in Washington state. We're in this process where we've lost a lot of farms and like things are kind of shifting and, and uh, the price of, I think the price is going to go up, you know, come, come May, uh, June, you know, that's what, that's when pot, pot prices always go up, you know, after the outdoors gone, people, you know, are ready for that fresh indoor, you know, May, June, July, kind of, before the major, the first depths come in. I guess by July you have the depths coming in. But. Hmm, that's odd for when you say that. Because, I, how in the hell? When did your grow season start up there? You're so far north. How do you get something where all the flower from outdoors is gone in June? Well, so to, so to, right, all the flowers kind of start. All the outdoor flower starts coming in around December, and. Um, Oh, I got you. It's like last yeah. year harvest last. Yeah, June. yeah like it's it's October. Okay. Not not harvesting, but when it's coming into the market, right? It's coming to the market in November, December. Uh, yeah, January. right. I got you now. Okay. And then we go we go through Christmas. So January and February are always dead for all retail, uh, including weed. You know, and then you come into March, and there's still a little bit of that outdoor floating around, but people are starting to pick it up. May people are starting to get hungry by June. People are fucking starved for good indoor. You know that's how it used to be. You could count on it, but you know it'd be June, July, August. You'd fucking rake it in. September, you know, but then the depths came in and then the depths started creaking in. So now they're you know September, August, July kind of are taken away because the depths are coming in. You know, but there still was always good money indoor to make. You know, in that May June area, you know, people were dying for weed. To the, through all through the end of medical. I so, got you. I, 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 that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think that's going to happen this year. That, that's going to be a little bit of the deal. We lost a lot of farms. I think a lot of shit's going to get blasted through the winter. And potentially prices could start coming up here in Washington. You know, especially for like really high quality stuff. Yeah. And for you people listening, the, the whole point of this was that, you know, because of so many people think they're just going to jump in and get rich. Well, this is a man that works his ass off all day, every day, into the night to the, to even pisses off his wife. He works so hard, you know, and uh, 
And yeah. he just got some Duke Diamond skunk. So there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know, and he, you can see that he's you know you're gonna be you're gonna end up out on top though eventually, and you know if not this, if not that, it'll be something else. It might be your conference. You know, your conference could blow up to be a thing where you know whenever the federal does change, and you can run that conference in fifty states. You know, that'll. That could be something for you in the future too. Well, I know, and I know you guys got something in cahoots. So I did, then there's the unnamed ideas that are going on flying around right now. And, you know, in, in where it's in planning stages, I'm sure is the whole point. And then, uh, you know, disclosure situations, because you don't give out your brilliant idea to get on top of the market to everybody on a social media. And then I kind of do, money. I kind of do. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, a, I don't hold it back, but, it's because I'm not, I'm not too, you know, I, and I, I'm not too worried about it. Like I got to make money. I got to take care of my family, but, um, this is what I'm doing. It's not like I didn't do this to get rich. You know, it was like, this is what I'm doing. You know, this is what I've, I've been doing for a minute. So, uh, you know, well, that's good because that's what we all wanted. If we think yeah, back years you know, ago, like, all I'm we gonna, wanted was thought to be reason, legal but... and we, we should be able to grow our own. And now it all of a sudden it's like, well, everybody wants it to be legal and then they want to grow it and make a million dollars, you know. And I'm like you. All I want to do is pay my bills and have good food to eat. And I'd like to be able to go some places, you know. I'd like to be able to afford to go places. But I don't, you know, I, I don't really need much. You know, I've got almost everything I want, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd like to be able to go places and do stuff too, but um, it's it's hard when you're growing weed, you know. And and I right. really just like grow. I like growing weed. I like growing weed year year round. Um, I like being around the plant. I like smoking the plant. And um, well, that's what's wrong with them investment bankers too. See, they don't understand that we. When you're a farmer, you don't get a day off anymore. If you once you start a farm. You don't, you don't, there is no like, well, maybe you're fortunate enough to have a big family and everybody's really into it or, but I mean, most, most in my, like we talked about on the show tonight, if, if you got a farm or something going on like that, you can't go anywhere. You, you gotta be at the farm. You know, it's hard. No, I bet it's hard as hell just for you to get over to when you come over to Michigan and, you know, Maine and all, you know. I can't imagine. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah, we get back both late and night. We get home and we're just like, we don't we don't talk for like you know it's kind of unspoken. We don't talk for three or four days because we both have so much catch up, but we're just getting blown up by all these people. And we want you know we want to get back, but it's like holy crap! Like me being gone for six days, I mean it's like crazy busy you know to catch up. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's it's like well, I hope it gets better for you. I hope the the legalization and the Washington market picks up for you, Bubba. You deserve it for your heart. It will, you know, it will, it will. It's like, it, just like anything else, you know, you got to go through the cycle and it's not fun. I know I bitched about it a lot, but I've got a lot of hope recently, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to ride that. Even if it's a little bit of false hope, I'm okay with that. Well, you're not going to run out of pot. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I have to grow. I can't, uh, interestingly, I can't even smoke the pot I grow in this recreational deal. Um, I have to I have to grow my own personal pot uh, outside of the fence in a, in a totally different area because that, that's all traced and tagged for recreational use. And so I'm, not, I'm only allowed to pull out of every, um, every lot, which is five pounds, I can pull out two grams to test. So, well, that's okay for a guy that smokes like, you know, four <laughs> to four grams in the morning and like, you know, four <laughs> grams at lunch, four grams at dinner, you know, it presents a problem. So I, I grow my own uh, under the medical laws here and I have a medical card and I can have 15 plants and I, I grow outdoors. Um, now I, now I grow outdoors and then I'll do, I'll do one in the winter, you know, usually just kind of bump things up. Well, that yeah. still works for you though. I mean, you know, if you can do 15 plants, you should be pretty, pretty, you should be taken care of, especially outdoors. You can grow them big ass trees. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can just about do it, but I have to, I usually have to get one, maybe two, two indoor crops to 
keep to keep going, you know. I you know, I don't I haven't talked about it a lot in the show, but I, I got hit by a car. Um that's how this started for me. I'm, I was riding my bicycle and I got hit by a car. So I have a, a really messed up back. Um, my whole body's pretty messed up and I have, you know, pretty severe pain. Um, yeah, because you were like a competition kind of off-road or, you know, mountain biking kind of guy, weren't you? Isn't that what you... Rock climbing. Rock, well, rock climbing, but I thought you did the bike Snowboard stuff. And snowboarding. Yeah, and snowboarding. Oh, snowboard. Yeah, I knew snowboard. Yeah. yeah. An adventure right. guy. And, you know, okay. Yeah. So you were just riding your bike. It wasn't a... It was, okay. No, yeah, I was just riding my bike to go get coffee when I got hit by a car. That's what was going on. But um, it changed my life. And so, it, it, consequently, I, I consume a lot of cannabis for pain. You know, it, it takes me a couple hours to get going in the morning. You know, coffee, stretching, uh, two, two, three joints sometimes. You know, sometimes I need to eat it in the morning. I definitely eat it every night. You know, there's not, not usually a night that I don't eat it. So, and I, and I consume a lot, you know, it's, it's about a pound a month, you know, so it, 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 you know, Tim, for me to get through 12 months, I need, you know, 12, 15 pounds, you know, uh, for edibles, you know, probably close to 20 pounds a year. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a lot, you know, but, but it, um, it's not, that. Yeah, it's, it's not, not, it's not, it really isn't, you know, and, and, and laws, legislature really needs to know that because. Um, there's a lot of people that have, a lot of people that have a lot more severe pain than I have right now, you know, that need a lot more, you know, if you have a, something, some of these really severe, uh, symptom or syndromes like Dravet syndrome, you know, with all the seizures and stuff, you consume a lot of, a lot of cannabis just to survive. Or if you have cancer and you're trying to go through a treatment, like, you know, they, it's like, a what is it? They, they suggest a gram a day of RSO, of FICO. Um, how many pounds does it take to make? I think it's like a two or three pound deal. I don't know. I can't do the math right now, but it's a significant, significant amount, you know. Hmm. And then, and you know, I, sorry, the, I could, the, the list goes on and on. Like I can just, you know, I'm about to start treating my dog because he's uh, he started getting some lumps all over his body, and we've had them tested, and, and they're not cancerous, but uh. I've had plenty of friends who have who've used it on their dogs and animals and their horses. I have I used to have an employee that would that, that would grow. They her and her mom had medical cards. This is funny, not funny, but uh, interesting. They had they both had their own medical cards. So they'd each grow fifteen plants on their property and they'd feed it all to their horse. <laughs> all of it. They went through all the trouble to get the cards so they could feed their horse and not get in trouble. Um, so. There's just a lot of a lot of a lot of ways to be using cannabis, you know, and, and uh, these these limits, even 15 plants is, is just ridiculous. We should be able to grow a garden like tomatoes, you know, as much as we fucking want. And, you know, as long as we don't sell it, then that's all cool. You know, if you want to sell it, you got to yeah. have a license, you know. See, that's a, I, I totally agree with that, too. Yeah, I think if it's if it's going to be if you're going to try to be in the business, you're going to have to jump through hoops. And if you're going to try to be medical, you're going to have to jump through a lot more hoops and it's going to cost a lot more money. But if you just want to grow it for personal use and your own medicine, you ought to be able to grow whatever you want to grow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 people are scared of, of, get, of it getting in the hands of children and stuff, which is kind of ridiculous, you know. Kind of not, you know, I, I, I see the point, you know, there's research about uh, brain development and. You know, well, some people are ignorant though, and they do ignorant shit, like leave their, their grow on the side of the side of the house by the sidewalk where the kids walk to school. Well, that, well, I, 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 don't know, I don't even know about that. Like, to be honest, I think. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That's what causes that weirdness. Why you, that you're, you're like, that, you understand it, but you don't like it, but you understand it because, well, that's you know, why. why it bothers me that I that my kid has to see people addicted to fucking fentanyl. I don't have a kid, but it would bother the fuck out of me. If I had a kid, they have to see people addicted to fentanyl on the way to school. You know, these, these people that are blacked out on the street because of a drug that can take people's lives. Fuck you if you have a problem with cannabis. It's never taken a single child's life or anyone else's. Like yeah, I, it really just I, is a plant. Like, it should be seen on the bullshit. But in here in Oklahoma, of people that want to put local restrictions and and be able to have a say, and if medical users can use your own shit, that's fine. I'm all for that. When I can tell you you can't take an opioid, then we can talk. Otherwise, go fuck yourself. Like that's something that drives me so mad 
is that people feel like they have a say in my cannabis medicine. I should have a say in your opioid medicine. Yours actually kills people. Yeah, I still have to err on the thing about you have to be responsible when it's around children. That's I'm sorry, but I'm going to take that stance. Yeah, yeah, but what is the what is the what are you protecting? You know, but yeah, here, have, here's something. There's no reason. Can I, can for I, that. I, I, well, I don't think it's prudent to let a six or seven year old get weed. All right. What I think about, what, about Will? what about my child? He's he's around weed all the time. He doesn't if, smoke it. He doesn't. Yeah, but you're let, let me talk. Hold on. Let me talk. He, he's around it. He doesn't smoke it. He doesn't use it. He doesn't have access to it. He's not ready for that. And my personal stance with my child. Uh, at this point, me and my wife, we don't want him to consume until he's like 23, 24 years old. Right. And his, his dad grows a fuck ton of weed. And I want to tell him about it. And I want to teach him how to grow weed all the way through. That's right not now, what I'm he, talking about, though. I'm right, talking well, about on, kids that aren't your kids that aren't educated going down to school and get into somebody's weed grow. They should not. They, they need to be more careful than that. That's all I'm saying. Like, you got to put a big fence around yours. I disagree. I disagree. Well, I just totally, I just totally disagree because kids kids don't you know it, it needs to be normalized like do you have to have a big fence around if you're growing oh. some barley and some hops no why because it has to be processed to be something that's actually of value to intoxicate and the kids don't even know what it is like if it, it, it's normalized there's plenty of things oh, that we can get yeah, high I'm, on we can oh, get high on what the is now man there's plenty of things that we can get high on in nature for mm -hmm. free and like why it's, it's only because this plant has been demonized in media and, and we all feel it like i've gone through the stages of it myself you know in my life where, where it's like it feels weird but straight up roger like to, to have a legal grow like this it totally changes my perspective like it's a fucking plant it should be everywhere it should not be an offense it should be everywhere and it should not be a deal because it, it has no harm and like, yes, we, we want to protect our kids. We want to protect people who need to be protected. We want to hold it into a sacred spot. But like, it's still just a plan. Yeah, but 80% of people out there are ignorant and they're not going to, they're not, they're, they're the danger of it all. The, the reason you what's, have to do what's more. The, what is the danger? What's the, the danger? What is well, the to danger? me, the danger is I'd be extremely pissed and I'd be coming at you with a gun if my kid got into your grow and had a bunch of weed and ingested that and he was six years and old. I'd say, I'd say, what the fuck was your kid doing on my property? Well, that's the whole point, though. Kids are like <laughs> kids are kids and ignorant adults are ignorant adults. You know, if you can't, you got to protect the idiots. That's all I'm saying. I'm not arguing your right to do what you want to do. I'm just saying we got to protect the kids and, and the kids should not be in, just like you said, you don't want your, your child to ingest cannabis till he's 23 or 24 after his brain's grown, you know? So we don't want to put it out there for some kids are going to be adventurous. They're going to dare each other, going to do things that they're not supposed to do. That's all. Uh, I'm you know, I, I just disagree because because I think that, you know, well, I've seen too many uh, cases of it, so I know it happens. So when you say no, then someone does that thing. If you tell them, explain the situation and make it open and real about it and up front and people, then kids can make their own logical conclusion. You can't so. explain it to all the kids in the world. You can only explain it to your kids. So, see, there's all the other kids that don't have parents that are intelligent enough to ex take that train of thought that they should warn or teach their kids and educate them about it they're just all ignorant walking around and they find a pot field you know they're going to do there's the potential for damage there there's potential for harm there and hard feelings and lawsuits and whether that's legal or not legal or whether you can grow it anywhere even if you could grow it all over the place anyway if something happened to a kid after you ingested cannabis on your land you're, you lose your land you, well, well, what, what would happen to the kid? Let's ask that well, say he walks out, he gets high as shit and walks out in front of a car. Say, well, he, dude, that has never happened ever. You telling me no kid's ever gotten stoned and walked out and got hit by a car? I mean, That's I not, that is not I, true. I can't tell you that 100%, you know, but like, come on, dude. Come on, that's a stretch. All right, anyways. <laughs> we're going we're going down a crazy thing. yeah we're just going down off off topic things now anyways um yeah i, I think we'll wrap the show up <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. um no, it's good to get the blood boiling once in a while you know yeah <laughs> you're gonna get me to go off i actually got into a big debate with this somebody earlier today and it really pissed me off um 
So we'll catch you guys again next week. Um, why don't you tell everybody how to find you, Josh, and how to find out the next conference? Uh, yeah, I'm at DutchBlooms.net, and uh, the conference is RegenerativeOrganicCannabis.com. Awesome. And what about you, Roger? And yeah. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Finish. Oh, up. I was gonna. I was gonna say uh, <laughs> the next conference will be in Redway, uh, California, at a preschool where no kids will be smoking weed. <laughs> well, you know, Dustin, that, that's probably a great, that's a great that you were able to find that. I remember talking to you about that. You've got a preschool where that's perfect. I mean, that'd just be perfect for what you're doing. That, I mean, the problem it is, for, it's the beautiful. Problem dude. Is it's so beautiful. really small. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a beautiful situation. A lot of the, a lot of the folks that, that come to the, the place uh, went to school there, or have friends or family that went to school there. Like, it, it you know, when you go to to a place like you got to come to to Redway, dude. When the whole community, the whole community grows weed, you, you see, you're just like, oh man, just a plant, just a plant. I got it. It is just a plant, and all this is crazy, crazy. Just a plant. That's the only thing you can say. Just a plant, you know. So, I'll stop. I'll stop. Alrighty. Um, and you can find uh, Roger. Do you want to tell people how to find you? You can find me at ilovegrowingmarijuana.com, and I agree. It is just a plant, and it's a it's one of the most uh, well known medicines throughout thousands of years, despite what the government or any other ignorant fool wants to tell you. And uh, you can find me at Potent Ponics, potentponics.com. Um, I'm going to be involved with a couple of the different farms that in the next four to six months you'll be able to buy weed from. So um, I will give you those here in the future. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, you know, check us out if you haven't checked out the other episodes or if you're listening to this in a different format. You can find us on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud. Uh, iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio, all the different things. So, yeah. Um, be sure to check us out and follow us in uh, in whatever format suits you best. And I appreciate all of you and all and um, look forward <laughs> to uh, next week's episode. I'm not quite sure who's going to be on yet. Someone from the uh, the conference for sure. I'm just not quite sure which person. I'm, I'm juggling around uh, schedules here to make sure everyone can get on. So we're gonna have a lot of people from the last uh, last conference that Josh put on. So uh, it'll be a lot of good a lot of good times and good info. We always have a blast with all the people at the conference have all been on the show pretty much. I mean, we talked about some other people tonight that were there that hadn't been on the show, but most of them have been on the show and we have a blast with every single one of them every time. Yeah. And I can always remember iHeartRadio because I heart growing marijuana. Yeah. You know? <laughs> all right. We'll catch everybody again next week. Cheers. Bye. Good night.